Uh, you know, I'm going to charge you for technical assistance here. You know that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody in person and via Zoom. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Bill Hutton. Um, Lieutenant with the Vero Beach Police Department here locally. I am also the acting vice chairperson of SAFER, which is Substance Abuse Free Indian River. Got that right, Michelle? Yes. Correct. Right. Thank you. <laughs> So what is safe? The purpose of our, it's a coalition, and the purpose of our coalition is to develop, implement, and promote environmental strategies to reduce substance abuse here in Indian River County. We're a coalition, a collection of various uh, organizations, law enforcement, uh, faith-based groups, and youth groups, and we try to promote as much as we can um, I think of the word, but uh, try to fight marijuana abuse, underage drinking, and prescription abuse here in New River County, and also in conjunction with highly avoid uh, tobacco use as well. Just don't want from my notes here. I apologize. Um, the coalition is open to everybody. Michelle uh, Buldo and Phyllis Schneider are here, so if anybody's interested, you can contact them on. Uh, information on how to join the coalition. Um, we do some really good things in the community, and we seem to be building. And I get uh, compliments all the time on, on the hard work that Michelle and Phyllis do as an organization. So, thank you, uh, Michelle and Phyllis. <laughs> um, people on Zoom should know already because I think they they're given that. Warning that it's going to be recorded, but everybody in here just to let you know that um, the presentation today mm -hmm. from Ed and Monty is going to be pre recorded. So if anybody has any issues with that, um, so I'm going to introduce Ed and Monty. Uh, Ed is going to do his presentation first. We'll take a short break. My, when we come back, Monty will do his presentation. We'll have some questions and, and answer for him with them and then Kylie Savoy will come up and uh, talk about what we do in our marijuana work group. So Ed Shamela, Ed has been a national coordinator for the National Marijuana Initiative for the past six years. Um, the initiative strives to dispel misconceptions about marijuana and raise awareness of issues surrounding uh, the drug so that citizens and policymakers can make well-informed choices regarding marijuana use and regulation. So currently we have medical marijuana and I guess the last, what was it, the last presidential election, mm -hmm. we had a push to legalize it totally in Florida. And then also we have, which Ed will probably bring up too, we had the hemp law that was instituted, which kind of runs afoul sometimes with law enforcement because now we have, you know, it's a little, little bit grayer than it used to be with uh, the new hemp law. Um, at its core, the National Marijuana Initiative exists to support 33 pilots, which is high intensity drug trafficking areas. So there's 33 of these areas throughout the country where there's an in, a great influx of drugs coming from various places throughout the world. So the, that's basically what that high, what HIDA means. As they work to carry out the now, National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, the National Marijuana Initiative does this by providing information to law enforcement, policymakers, changing policies on marijuana, and ultimately it works to assist people in making informed choices about marijuana by providing them with valid information. And Ed has over 40 years of experience in law enforcement. Monty Stiles. Monty Stiles has been a, uh, for, 29, uh, for 29 years was a state and federal prosecutor. Uh, his uh, focus was multinational and international uh, drug trafficking organizations. You got that right, Monty, so far? Pretty close. Good. <laughs> uh, 1995, Monty served as special counsel to the director of the executive office for U.S. attorneys in Washington, D.C., where his primary assignments involved domestic terrorism, violent crime, juvenile justice, and narcotics. Um, to raise law enforcement career, Monty was also a passionate drug educator, a motivational speaker for school, businesses, and churches. 
also law enforcement agencies, prevention groups, and other youth and parent organizations. And then one of his proudest personal and career achievements was uh, implementation of the Enough is Enough, right, throughout Idaho. That it's an anti-drug campaign which provided community coalitions throughout the state of Idaho. Uh, now, Monty serves as a consultant for community drug coalitions, law enforcement agencies, and other organizations. Good. Did it all right? All right. So, I think I'm done. I'm going to turn it over to Ed. All right. Thanks, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, here. Well, what did Michelle do this time? Okay. Gotta let them all in here, huh? Well, is is you know if you notice that introduction, the difference between a cop and a lawyer. Mine was two paragraphs; his was two pages. It's your number. And yeah, I'm humble. <laughs> you know, my I, I always got to tell a lawyer joke since there's a lawyer in the house there, and you know the definition of a tragedy, right? That's a busload of lawyers goes over a cliff and there's an empty seat. No, that's a tragedy, right? There, there you go, Monty. <laughs> Good. Now, Monty, uh, I love him dearly. He is one of our speakers on the NMI Speakers Bureau. Uh, you're never going to meet a more passionate, dedicated individual in the fight uh, that we are currently under for the, the health and well being of our children in this country. And what I love about Monty is he walked away from a very successful career in the United States Attorney's Office, uh, just walked away because he could no longer uh, stand what was going on and decided he was going to do this as his, as his passion. But what really intrigues me about Monty is the fact that th this fool chases mountain lions, trees and so he can climb a tree and take pictures of them. And you really <laughs> need to see some of the amazing photography he has a mountain lion tree, and then he just lets him go, which I've never understood that, but that's a lawyer for you anyway. But anyway, I'm glad to be back here. Uh, I am uh, a frequent flyer with Michelle. Uh, she always brings me back here when it's hotter than heck. But the very first time I met Michelle, she brought me to New Jersey when she was back in New Jersey. And uh, I experienced a a nor'easter and uh, i sat in a hotel room for two and a half days in atlantic city while it just snowed and snowed and snowed mm -hmm. just to turn around and go back so uh and now i find out she's in florida and she only brings me down here when it's 150 degrees <laughs> i just go from one extreme to the other with michelle so there's no happy medium ever i'm honored to be here uh as is the intro, the lieutenant, when he introduced me, uh, I'm eight years now with NMI, 40 years, 42 years in law enforcement, 30 years with Kentucky State Police, most of that in drug law enforcement. Uh, I, the last eight years, I ran the cannabis suppression branch with KSP. Most people don't realize that, that we're the second most prolific illicit marijuana producing state in the nation, second only in California, uh, but that's all the clips now that we currently have. Uh, 36 states plus the district that have medicalized this substance and 16 states plus the district that have commercialized DHC. I, you will not hear me refer to this as uh, recreational marijuana because I see nothing recreational about getting high as a Georgia pine. When you talk about recreation in Kentucky, we talk about hiking, biking, fishing, hunting, boating, stuff that actually has physical and or mental or spiritual benefits to you and getting high is nothing in my mind recreation. I, I'm also, I spent all of my career in Appalachia in, in Kentucky. And as you all probably may be aware of, we basically were in the forefront of the, the opioid uh, pandemic in this country. We started with pharmaceutical grade product in the mid nineties. Uh, that, that as we started to shut fuel mills down, uh, we mo moved into heroin and now into fentanyl. Uh, we're still losing anywhere from 12 to 1400 Kentuckians every year to opioid overdose deaths. Uh, we usually lose twice as many Kentuckians at, at, to overdose deaths than we do in automobile crashes in my state. And it's a significant problem. 
And but I'm going to come here. We're going to talk for the next 90 minutes or so. What what I think and I still believe with all my heart is the most dangerous drug in America. Absolutely unequivocally, the most dangerous drug in America is marijuana. And the reason I say that, there's two reasons I, I will say that. When you look at all the other illicit drugs, and I'll show you some illustrations of that in a minute, and you combine all of the other illicit admitted drug use in this country, it doesn't even come close to half the admitted marijuana use in this country, and that number is growing every year. But that's not what makes this drug so dangerous. What makes it so dangerous is this is absolutely the most misunderstood drug in a pharmaceutical. Without a doubt, you may think you know marijuana, and I look around here, and, and most everybody appears to be uh, considerably younger than Monty and myself. <laughs> and uh, you know, the problem is that this was still the drug that was around when I was in high school in the late 60s and early 70s. I wouldn't even come to this hot place and waste your time talking about it because unless you were a young person, it was a, for all intents and purposes, a really relatively benign harmless substance, unless you were in that subset. And that's the group that uh, young folks that don't have the fully developed frontal cortex, your brain's not there. Uh, but it all changed radically and dramatically when Colorado did what they did at 12. And uh, the drug today that we are dealing with did not even exist in the shape, form, and fashion, and more importantly, in the potency that exists today uh, until Colorado did what it did. And we'll talk a little bit about that, see if we can get this to work. All right. What, what ain't working, tech guy? Click on the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. Zoom box the there we go. There we go. So what we're going to try to hit today, we're not going to hit all of these because uh, my partner and I, everybody thinks NMI, you know, we support the 33 Hydas. We're the marijuana subject matter experts, as was stated in the intro. Uh, we're all things marijuana for all the Hydas. Everybody thinks when you come in, we've got a great staff. We do have a great staff and subject matter experts. i got a speaker's bureau. We've got about 16, 17 brilliant people on here, but there's just two of us. For the high world, and uh, it's crazy. Uh, we before COVID, we were on the road about 150, 170 nights a year, talking to groups just like this, scratching our head, wondering if we were even making a difference. And one of the beautiful things you're going to hear about money is how you can make a difference with the information that you have. Not that you all don't already do that, but these are the things when I talk about legalization that we call them common issues, common concerns. That regardless of how, it doesn't matter how well intended your legislative body is, inevitably every one of these things occurs when you legalize this drug, either medically and or commercially. Without a doubt, we call them public health, public safety, and other topics. We're going to hit on a couple of these in each of these areas. Understand when we do this class, it's a four hour class because we call it what to expect. And I think we actually did one down here several years ago. I did a whole day or down here several years ago. So if you were that, did some of you, some of you there? Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you're going to have to sit through this again. I would love to tell you that things have gotten better in this country since we were here last, but they haven't. We're going to touch a little on that. What I hope to accomplish today is give you a little insight to these issues. I want to hit a couple topical areas, look at where we are at the federal level. We're going to talk a little bit about hemp, CBD, and the Delta A issue that's coming as a result of hemp. And then we're going to wrap this thing up, hopefully, with some ideas or suggestions that you need to follow up. And I'm going to give you some resources when we leave out of here that you will be able to access with some really good science. Because here's the thing that we aren't doing in this country. Unlike what we were told with COVID and for the last 20 months, We've been, whether it's masking, whether it's been distancing, whether it's been whatever, the science is dictating all of these restrictions that we've been living under here. It's, it's unique that, and I find it kind of disingenuous that when it comes to marijuana, we don't follow the science here. And we've never followed the science. So you cannot pick and choose in this country when it is convenient to follow the science. And I'm gonna show you some of the science that, that shows you just how detrimental this substance is in its current existence is to our young people in this country. Because make no mistake about it, our young people are the target of this industry. 
this is an, I know I'm not supposed to say addiction, you know, it, but this is an addiction industry, much like the alcohol and tobacco industry is. This is an addiction industry. I usually go through this and, uh, you know, because it, the plan and Monty will tell you the three principal groups that have been initiating this and understand in this country, this isn't something that started five, six, seven years ago. This is a, a process that's been in evolution for the last 40, 45 years. And the principal drivers of this have been the Drug Policy Alliance, the Marijuana Policy Project, the normal. And these groups have been very laser focused in their goal. And their goal was to legalize marijuana for, for commercial or quote unquote recreational use. But that's not the end game. You talk, look at the DPA, the end game of the DPA is the legalization of all drugs. The legalization. And a, how, do, how do we know that? All you got to do is go to their website. And also look at what happened in San Francisco a couple years ago, in Denver two years ago, and then what happened last uh, November in Oregon. Uh, they were instrumental in legalizing psilocybin mushrooms in San Francisco and in Denver, and they were instrumental in the removal of any criminal penalties for the possession of any illicit drug under certain amounts in the state of Oregon. That's where we are headed as a country. Then you couple the fact that this industry that is projected to be a 20 to $30 billion industry this year, they are basically two forces that are working in concert to accomplish this mission. And there's all of us out here trying to do our level best with limited fiscal resources, but we have right on our side and we always will have right on our side. However, we are struggling to overcome the financial deficit that we're in. We'll make no bones about it. Marijuana is not a black issue. It's not a white issue. It's not a brown issue. It's not a yellow issue. There's only one color of marijuana. It's a green issue. It's all about money. It is all about money. If you think anything other than that, then you are fooling yourself because this industry is driven by one motivation, and that is money. And in order to do that, they have to have an addicted client base. And unfortunately, that's our young people. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. If you look at where we are in this country, this kind of gives you a snapshot of what the country looks like with medical uh, right here. But commercial marijuana and uh, then you throw hemp in and I got a color Idaho. I've got to change the color on there because Monty just informed me that Idaho is now a hemp state. So essentially all we've got left is South Dakota and Mississippi that have not enacted the hemp provision. When you throw those two overlays in, you look at this and you look at this, essentially we're a, a sea of green in the United States. We are headed that way towards some shape when you talk about where you are in Florida with medical and hemp, and we'll talk about the hemp debacle here in a minute. Uh, we're green with weed and getting greener every day. And uh, just the reality where we are. I always like to shrug, throw this out here because it shows you the evolutionary process. When you look at phase one, what happened in California in 96, how long it took them in this group to go from medical to commercial about 16 years. The second phase uh, took about 13 years. The third phase, on average, about five years in there, South Dakota. South Dakota did something last November nobody's ever done. They went from nothing to medical and commercial all in one day, to ballot referendum. Fortunately, uh, the, the uh, Commercial ballot referendum is being challenged in court in South Dakota, but medical is there. But they've done something, and that's how quickly this process is accelerated. You ask the question why, and I'll tell you why. Because I don't care how many people you have in your state, even the state of Florida, there's not enough sick people to sustain a medical model. The money is in commercial THC. And that's why this process is accelerated. I suspect you didn't have it on the last presidential election. When's the next gubernatorial race in, in Florida? Next year. 
Huh? Next year. Next year. That is a possibility for another ballot push to get wrecked. Uh, usually, is is that usually a high turnout on vote? It is. I see a no and a yes. Uh, <laughs> usually, it's a presidential cycle that gets the highest turnout. So you may end up not having to deal with this again until 24 in the presidential cycle, but you're going to deal with it again. It's not going away. And it's not going away. I think there were some challenges to your the initiative last year to get enough signatures, but it is what it is. And you're not going, just because it didn't happen, don't mean you can rest on your laurels because it's going to happen again. And that's where we are. Then you throw this in. It's the Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act. This used to be the MORE Act, uh, Mar Marijuana Opportunity Re Reinvestment or Expungement. But since now we can't say marijuana because it, it's too harsh a term and stigmatizes people, uh, Schumer refers to this as the Cannabis Administration uh, Opportunity Act. And essentially, what we have in Congress right now is federal legislation that is trying to remove THC and marijuana from the schedule. But we've already done that with him in the three tenths of a percent designation to the 2018 Farm Bill. What this would do is be successful in removing it completely from the schedule, basically saying no marijuana no longer is scheduled on controlled substances. And you look through here, it transfers it from the DEA to the ATF. Uh, so we're going to regulate this much as the ATF does tobacco and alcohol. But most importantly, what this is all about is the federal government wants a piece of the the pie because they're going to tax the crap out of the production and distribution of marijuana and part of that money they're going to put into uh you know conducting studies on the impacts and we'll touch about it. they don't need to conduct any study because marijuana is already having a significant impact on impaired driving all you got to do is look at the back that is emerging from the states that have done this yeah promulgate federal advertise really we're going to advertise this so it's no longer schedule one because you cannot legally advertise a schedule one control substance, right, Monty? No, nope. can't do it against the law to do that. But go to every one of these states, including your state, and you will see advertisement or a schedule one control substance, a direct violation of federal law. But yes, by the way, marijuana still, regardless of what your state says, marijuana is still a schedule one drug under the CSA. Still a schedule one. There's a conundrum that would remove that. Provide fundings to uh, to uh, go move with expungement of all records. Now you, you know, and, and here here is one thing I actually agree on. It doesn't matter what your assessment is. You know, if we're going to start talking about young people, and young people will make bad decisions, and the reason we make bad decisions as young people is because the last area of that brain to develop is that frontal lobe, that cortex where executive function occurs. You know, scientists tell us in women, it's about 24 to 25 years of age as men get there a little later, 26, 27, but you ladies already knew that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my wife's still hoping I get there one day, but you know, I ain't <laughs> made it yet, but well, she's hoping. But anyway, if we're going to acknowledge that that's the case in of itself, compound the fact that THC most adversely affects that area of development in the brain that isn't fully developed, then it's natural to believe that if you're going to make a bad decision, that you have to address, no, no, don't get me wrong, we still need consequences for poor choices. But once behavior has been demonstrated that you have moved on from those poor choices, that record, and I've had to do a 180 view on this as a cop, that record doesn't need to follow you the rest of your days. It doesn't. Because it's really not fair. If you look at what we're supposed to do as a society, rehabilitate people, bring them back into the fold. If you have already done what you're supposed to do to, to, to mediate that wrong, you know, particularly with young people, and I'm talking about young people, but once there is a demonstrated change in behavior, then we've got to have the ability to, to recognize. And that's one, the only really provision I agree with here. Is there has to be a process for moving forward in this? There has to, but this is there, and uh, the the principle obvious. What makes this kind of scary? Because the principle obvious now of a Democrat-controlled House 
and a Democrat controlled Senate and on the Hill is a former Republican Speaker of the House John Boehner. Marijuana sheep lobbyists on the Hill. And I think we'll know a whole lot more after the midterms, the, the viability or survivability of this act. But if this actually passes and, and an administration is inclined to say they will sign it, then we've completely changed the landscape because marijuana no longer is a Schedule One controlled substance under this act. And it opens up the door for a host of issues. That's where we are in this country. 36 plus the district, medicalized, 16 plus the district, and commercialized THC. And now we're looking at this act on the Hill. Uh, and every year, every state that has not, and my state included, uh, is trying to move the needle towards either medical and or commercial THC. Okay, so that's a good question. Yes. Does this um, just legalize it for purposes of use, or does it do away with marijuana trafficking? Well, it actually leaves the state. It, yeah. it, it leaves it up to the state to make a decision, pretty much what they are. So it removes it from the schedule, but basically what the act says is you as an Idaho yeah. can decide what you want to do with this. So my intention to is that if we're going to keep it the same regardless. What yeah, the yeah, but it's up to the state. So, but what it here here's the scary thing basically gives the industry access to, to the banking industry the only thing they can't really this is I, this is the biggest driver here the lack the thing they lack you know one thing they need is access to our, our financial industry and they don't have it yeah so this is where we are and this kind of gives you an idea we start looking about this this number right here is kind of scary because uh as i told you earlier on marijuana use and the numbers of people that are initiating every year continues to grow, but also does this number. These are people that are using 200 days a year. They're stoners. These are people that no longer can contribute to society because they are impaired more than they are not. And they are impaired on a substance that did not exist literally seven, eight years ago when Colorado did what they, they did. This number continues to grow. That's the everyday user. Uh, and, and that's the number that should concern us all. I would wager that you could probably go into any school in your county here and talk to any child and they will tell you they have no problem finding somebody that has marijuana, that can access marijuana. Baking probably is the preferred delivery device as it is in most schools that we deal with across this country, principally because of the stealthiness of the device. And what you need to understand too is what they are initiating on isn't anything like what's available when I was Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that too. And here's the whole issue. If you don't remember anything, and I was telling them, I was in Iowa the first part of this week. Iowa was the only state that actually limited potency and limited it at three and a half percent, which is huge because nobody's limited potency. But the industry being the industry convinced the legislature that they needed to remove the cap because sick people needed medicine. So they traded potency for a possession limit of four and a half grams. Mm -hmm. As people, it's not about how much you possess, it's what you possess. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. So I said the stupidest thing you all ever did was trade your potency cap for size limit. Because four and a half grams of 80% shatter will knock you on your butt you would have been better off capping your potency, but that's exactly how this process works. And that's why you always have to be diligent, stay up on what's going on, because if you're not, there are three steps ahead of you. And if you're not influencing policymakers with this information, they are. And they're doing a very effective job with disinformation, misinformation about this substance, and they're getting things done. It's all about potency. Everything that we're going to talk about is predicated on potency because it is driving all the issues and people are demanding higher potency product and they're getting it. But potency is, is you can equate potency to profitability. That's where the industry makes their money. The higher the potency product, the more it costs. And that, that's where the money is derived from here. So we look about that, you know, it's at historic highs. When you look at potency, you probably see if you were here before you've seen these numbers, and why I say 95, what's significant about 95? Because we had nothing in 95 with respect to 
legal metal, medical marijuana, or commercial. Until 1996 with Prop 215, and what happened with Prop 215 in California, when you look at THC, uh, example, you know, 4% was some really, really primo dope. You know, when you thought of us, off the chart stuff, 4%. You can't give that crap away now. That's not much different than him. And nothing really changed from a statistical, yeah, eight points, but you look to 2014, you know, a year after Colorado implemented that, 12% was some really quality stuff. Eight points is statistically significant unless so you're in that group, in that subset that's most vulnerable to the adverse effects of Delta 9. It's really not that significant from a harmful standpoint, unless you're a young person. And understand too, when we move forward, all of the legitimate research in this country on the harms of marijuana to the healthy brain have been done in the eight and 12 percent range. Pretty much in line, and we know those are pretty detrimental, pretty much in line with where the end user was experiencing with marijuana. And, and again, those harms are pretty, pretty well documented to the young developing brain. However, in 2017, you look at averages that ran anywhere from 23 to 34%. And what I still find interesting, and I still have the, the least, I still get High Times Magazine. Uh, so I can't help myself. It's, the, it's you know, it's kind of like for, you know, the Playboy magazine of marijuana, you know, you know I can't have Playboy, but I look at High Times, you know, I like looking at weed, I'm crazy. Anyway. But anyway, High Times in the December 2014 issue said from a botanical standpoint, it is impossible to grow marijuana on the vine in the flower that will exceed 30%. Well, guess what Colorado did in 14? They did just that. They exceeded 30%. Last year, the state of Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division in their annual report, the industry purported to have tested raw flower in excess of 45%. And from that, we are concentrating and we're seeing numbers in the 80 up for 90%. It is amazing what the industry has done since Colorado did what they did. Because for the very first time, without a fear of federal intervention or retribution, the, the industry, the old adage of the tie-dye hippie was growing weed, was pushed aside, and the industry started hiring botanists and agronomists. They came in and genetically engineered and modified this plant, not only to increase yield, but also to increase potency and dry potency through the roots. And you talk to these individuals, which I have in, in Washington and Oregon and in Colorado, and they will tell you, why are you doing this? Well, I'm getting paid three times what commercial ag paid me to do the same thing. I'm just taking my trade and applying it for corn, wheat, soybeans, over the wheat. Doesn't it bother you that you're developing a, a drug that essentially did not exist prior to this and the harm? Uh, it's not mine. I gotta get my money and I'm out. This is where we're at. But this is how this industry has evolved. And one of the beautiful things about it, if you're in a state that's actually looking at doing this, is you don't start where Colorado started in 12 and 13. When this happens in your state, and when it did happen in your state in 16 or 17 when you medicalized, you're the benefactors of where Colorado, Washington, Oregon were right then. So you don't have to go through the evolutionary process. You start with the same grade, same quality of marijuana that they have to better. And that's the hard thing to get people to understand is you don't have to go through this evolutionary process because they've already done it. No need to reinvent the wheel, grab it, because guess what? It's a small group of individuals in this country that control it. Small group of corporations in this company that are controlling this industry. This has all the earmarkings of following the plan that tobacco followed. It really does. And here we are. THCA 99, I'll show you what that looks like, 99%. Uh, it's absolutely astounding. Get through here really quick for the sake of time. This kind of gives you an idea of where potency is going. If you'll notice this little line right down here, this green line is CBD. And I got news for you folks, if you're a CBD lover, uh, what we're finding is very, Few of these products contain any CBD at all. As a matter of fact, some of the products that we've actually tested that are purported to be high in CBD concentration, the highest product that we have tested is produced four tenths of 1% CBD. Guess what we've also seen? 
supposed to be particularly a hemp derived CBD product. Mm -hmm. South Carolina pulled hemp last year, sled, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, 17% THC. Virtually no CBD. So if you're a believe, a believer of CBD that's going to help fix every ailment you got from male pattern baldness over there to <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> Uh, you know, the what anxiety and, and uh, it probably don't have any CBD in it. And to be quite honest with you, if you're subject to a random drug screen as a workplace, you're probably going to test hot for THC. You know, what we are finding in more cases or not, they vastly exceed the stated uh, the advertisement virtually no THC or three tenths of a percent less THC. It's not happening in this country. So, the old adage. We'll get to that caveat into a buyer beware. This kind of gives you an idea of where we're at uh, in this country. Uh, you look at raw plant material, uh, and now it, I've got to change that because we've got over 40, 44% that's been actually confirmed in testing. And then you have these concentrates that go anywhere depending on what you can afford to pay. Uh, this is the reality. When you look at what the market share is here, and about every instance in these states, about 70% of the market share are these products right here in Edwards. Only, only about 30% of the share is, is the raw flour. But we have seen a, a clientele in this industry move to higher potency products. And that is right. It doesn't matter where you're at, what state you're at. It goes anywhere from about 67 to 71% of market share is anything other than raw flour in here. And that's unfortunately where the highest concentration of potency exists here. It's also the most profitable for the industry. And again, some example, this is THCA. It's right here. What's to the cops? What if you thought what would you think that was? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Hit it, hit it on a standard test, field test, it ain't gotta do nothing. THC a naturally occurring cannabinoid. Actually, it, it is the, the predominant factor in determining potency. When you start to, I used to know the, how to, the mathematical equation, not the delta nine number, it's the, it's the THC a number, because what's, what's really unique about THC, by the way, is one of the most expensive marijuana products on the market. Uh, it's going anywhere from 185 to 225 a gram. Uh, once you hit it to an ignition store, put it in your pipe, crack pipe, what have you, light it up, Instantly converts to THC, and we have confirmed testing at 99.5% THC. Go to YouTube, watch the videos of THCA, watch these guys take hits. Literally, their eyes will roll to the back of their head and they'll hit the floor. Why you would find that amusing is beyond me. Why you would even want to do that to yourself is beyond me. But they will say this is the ultimate, ultimate THC high right now. And I believe because they're the experts, not me. <laughs> Public health potency, again, tic tac size, you know, they don't, you know, y'all heard it, everybody familiar with 420, right? You know what that is? That's, that is, that was the term that coined by a bunch of California kids back a lot of years ago. They met, uh, I, I kind of find it humorously, they met as, at a statue of Louis Pasteur at 420 in the afternoon to smoke dope. But since it has become the National Marijuana Smokers Holiday on April 20th, 420, light one up. Well, 420 has been usurped by 710. They want to know what 710 is. I guarantee your kids in your school know what 710 is. I guarantee you they do. Oil upside down backwards. 710 oil. That is replaced the smoke. Ain't that right, Monica? Yeah. That's it. And I, the illustration I always use, I was picking up my grandson a couple of years ago at middle school. And I look out and I wait on him to come out the door. And here comes this kid with 710 across his shirt. London, Kentucky. And we don't even have any of this crap. So I, I naturally get my camera, my phone out, and I take a picture. And I ask my son, grandson, I said, who's that kid? He told me, he said, I said, you know what that means? He said, yeah, it's a well. So what kind of well? It's a marijuana well. Stuff you do. And I said, yeah. Does your school know about that? He said, I don't know, but we all know about it. So I get the principal. We actually actually go to church together and I ask him, I said, Steve, you 
You got kids running around promoting marijuana in your school. No, we don't. I said, yeah, you do. So we absolutely do not. I will not tolerate that. I get my phone and I said, see that? He said, that ain't nothing marijuana. I said, look it up. Five and ten, look it up. Because it's oil and it actually has everything to do with marijuana. And these kids in your pen, he was flabbergasted. That's the problem we run into. Our kids know more about this substance than their parents do. And if you have kids and you're not talking to your kids, they are. Yeah. They don't have your children's best interests. So we've got to figure out how we better engage our kids in the platforms that they're paying attention to because they are. And it is just a reality where we are today. And again, concentrates that the reason they call it a dab, and I was telling Michelle out there, I was in Denver last week. And I was going to meet my partner, and I pull up to a red light. I've got a turn signal, and uh, getting ready to go into the Ida. And I, right up beside me, pulls a car. It's got, looks like a 17, 18 year old male and female in there. And I look over there, Bonnie. She gets out her, her pipe. She lights her torch. She heats her needle, and they do a dab right in the car. Both of them take a hit right in the car. Downtown Denver, Colorado. And they're doing a dab in the car. And I just looked over there. I couldn't get my phone out fast enough or the light changed. And off they went. Wow. Don't think we've got impaired drivers in this country? Yes, we did. It's absolutely amazing what is going on in these states. And I think you probably would be surprised what's going on in your state. And what your kids know. Again, I'm still astounded. Why do we have this? Because the consumer is demanding it. It still goes both to the fact that here we are again, making public health, public safety decisions that are absent of valid scientific research to support that. And again, how we why we continue to do that. I know why. Why we continue to let people do that, follow the science. Let me, and here, here let me just clear something there. Right here. Cannabis is detailed, 113 plus cannabinoids. I stand up here and tell you there's absolutely nothing of medical value in that plant. I'm lying my butt off to you. Absolutely lying my butt Because there is, and we know there is. But in the same token, if I tell you crude marijuana, either smoked or ingested, is medicine and or a medical delivery device, I'm also lying my butt off to you too. That's the conundrum with this drug. Absolutely the conundrum with this drug. So let's talk a little bit about youth usage. And this again is the, uh, you know, this was taken several years ago. You know, you know where that is, don't you? Yep, Denver. Denver, state capital in the background. You know, I've used this and, and I've looked at this and I took me last year, finally realized this old dude standing right here. I never saw him before. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. And I have looked at that picture, What's the show that picture, because this is 420 on 420 in front of the Denver State Capitol, and there's probably 15,000 sick kids there that are smoking. That's not fog either. And there's this one little, this old dude right here. <laughs> and I've never seen him. And he's probably thinking, what have they done? They've hijacked my weed. <laughs> you know, there's your hippie stoner. And he's in here amongst these people and he's kind of trying to figure out, why am I even here? Because even he, what he did, what he smoked, does not exist anymore. But this is it. And we're going to start looking at, you know, and I'm going to show you where Florida ranks with the U.S. average and Colorado. I'll use Colorado as a benchmark because they were the first. We're going to look at past month drug use mental health survey, uh, the, the gold standard. Uh, if you use once, at least once in the last 30 days. So let's take a look. This is this is 12 to 17 year olds from 2012 to 19. Uh, you look at Colorado's orange. The uh, you all are in yellow line, and, and this actually this number had been decreasing. Uh, and you all are actually right now faring just just below the national average in that age category. But I think we, we started to see an uptick in 2017. 
in this age group. And we, we really didn't understand why it was going down, but I, I have a theory and uh, Monty may agree or and not, but he, he deals a lot more with kids than I do. But I think this is the reason. Marijuana, when you look at this age group, 12 to 17, marijuana is the number one reason this age group is seeking treatment for addiction in this country. Marijuana. I could not tell you how many times I've heard stories from youngsters all over this country that have come up after a presentation and they have a friend or somebody they knew or a sibling that had an a, a extremely adverse reaction to high potency marijuana. Uh, but I think when you look at the fact that 12 to 17 year old, this is the number one reason they're seeking treatment for addiction. For addiction. It's marijuana. The number one reason by far is marijuana. I think that's the reason. Now we're starting to see this uptick. This number starting to go up again. It has been since 17. It's kind of concerning that we were doing a really good job of bringing it down, but now we're starting to see a slow rise up here. But here's where you rank. This is the, to me, this is the group that really scares the bejeebers out of me. It's 18, 25 year olds. These are our college kids and those getting ready to enter into the workforce. And they are absolutely using at alarming rates. Still in that most vulnerable subset, they don't lack that fully developed brain. They are the ones that are using at the most frequency. Uh, when you look at Vermont, almost 40% of Vermonters in this age group, four, think about that, four in 10 admit the past month marijuana use. It's astounding. These are the people that are getting ready, who are in college and getting ready to come out and enter into the workforce. And they have a completely different divergent view on this substance. And when you think about why do young people have such, why is it so easy for them to understand uh, tobacco cessation and that? Well, they never experienced like I did the Marlboro Man or the Virginia Slam Girl, or they've never been inundated with advertisement on tobacco. If you've been born from 2000 on, all you ever seen is marijuana is benign, it's harmless, it's medicine. That's all they've ever heard. So it's really easy to understand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, why this is the case. But this is where you rank. And uh, no, nothing to be proud of at 21% that are admitted uh, using. Uh, even though you are a little bit below the national average, you're nothing like Colorado. But uh, this, this, this group really concerns me. Then when you look at 26 and above, uh, you're always on the uptick, but again, you're below the national average. Anybody want to guess that uh, and within this age group, what is the fastest growing uh, demographic? We've been over there. All right. I don't know what's you, going on. You have to come to the front now. <laughs> My watch is there too. All right. That, that, that was rude. You know that? <laughs> I mean, if I, if I was from New Jersey, I would be offended. I'm used to that happening, so I, I'm not offended. So. But anyway, if you look at what age group in here is, is the fastest growing segment of users in here, anybody want to guess what it is? Me and Monty's age. Yeah. Yes, yes. And guess what? We, we, we didn't, we, yeah, and I'm going to tell you why. We, we didn't use this stuff back then. Maybe we did, but. Uh, it wasn't that bad, but now we're, you know, we got bad backs, we got bad knees, and the docs want to hook us up on pain pills, and I, I, I don't want to go down that route. I've heard about the analgesia benefits of THC. I don't want to smoke, because I, I, I know that's bad for you, so I'm going to try these edible products, and that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here as a 60, almost 65-year-old man, and I, you know, you know, one-sixth of a chocolate chip cookie is a therapeutic med uh, medical dose. I'm going to eat a whole sleeve of chips away in one city. So I eat one cookie, nothing happens because we know that's the most slowest transmission rate or method there is, is ingesting. So I eat another one, nothing happens. I eat a third one, 20 minutes later, nothing happens. I eat the fourth one, all of a sudden it hits. I'm sitting here and next thing I know, I'm starting to get shaky in my extremities, heart palpitations, I'm sweating, a little bit of shortness of breath. At my age, I'm thinking I'm having a coronary event. I'm going to the ED, presenting as a coronary event, when all in, and what they're finding out for the talks is the only thing I've got high level of THC in my system, because you can't overdose on THC. 
and it's happening on a regular basis. You can overdose on anything, including water, and drink it up. So it is happening all over this country. Ron Eatleb, uh, Dr. Lev used to be the chief medical officer at ONDCP, and now the, she has always been the attending physician at Scripps ED in San Diego. Eight to 10 patients every day come into her ED overdosed on THC. Eight to 10 a day, 365 days a year, they're overdosing on THC. It happens. This kind of gives you a snapshot of 12 to 17 year olds. And where you, I know it's hard to see here, but the blue arrows are you. Uh, you know, and you're fluctuating up there, but all I can tell you, this is the very first casualty we see anytime a state does this, is an increase in usage rates in all three categories. Uh, it's inevitable, it will happen, and it's incumbent upon groups just like you to get on the front of this issue and to be talking to your kids because this is our always our first casualty in legalization for young people. And again, it's the target of this industry of our young people. And there is where we are, unfortunately. And why? You take here's what we've done in this country. We've gotten rid of harm, we've done gotten rid of risk. Marijuana availability is at an all-time high. I'm telling you right now in this country that we are flooded with weed. Coupled with particularly the raw product is at historic lows in prices. Cheap, with exception of concentrate, cheap weed that you can actually concentrate yourself. You don't have to be a chemist to do that. So you have cheap raw product, historic lows all over the place. You can go home, do your own concentrates. I can give each of you 20 bucks to go to Home Depot. You can come back with everything you need, apps in the weed, <coughs> to extract weed here. And you can make your own concentrates from that. And this is why use is going up in this country. When you look at initiatives and perception of risk, you look at alcohol, still the number one drug people are initiating on 12 and older in this country. Still the number one. Every year, more people initiate on alcohol than any other. Guess what's number two? We put this in perspective 3.4 million new marijuana initiates every year. What's that mean? 9,500 a day, 397 an hour, six a minute, or one every 10 seconds in this country is initiated. The average age last year of initi initiation on marijuana is 11 years, 11 months. The average age of initiation, that's average. That means they're equal enough. Yeah, that's average, the average age here. That's kind of scary. Anybody got any 11, 12 year olds in here? Anybody got any kids in here? <laughs> yeah, all right. all right, there we are. This is where we are. You look at this, and that goes back to where you, you couple the other statements, combine the rest of them together, still doesn't equal this. This number grows every year. I think in the last survey that came out, we were like 45 million regular. I suspect we're probably going to be closer to 47, 48 million admitted regular marijuana users in this country. There's still more of us that don't use and do than do use, but this industry is much like the alcohol. The alcohol industry makes 80% of its profits off of 20% of its users. Guess what we're finding in these states is commercialized THC. They're making about 80% of their profits off of 20% of the users. Go back to that one slide. The person that's using 200 time, 200 days a year. That's where they're making their money from. Same playbook, same issue. You look at people that uh, the perceived risk, and look where marijuana is. You know, 56% less than LSD or alcohol. It is no wonder our young people are using and continue to use. We've done such a good job in this country of marginalizing the, the, the risk of this substance to our young people. But they see nothing really wrong with this at all. Think it's safer. And then when you look at public health issues, treatment data, this one really concerns me right here. Marijuana is the number one reason this age group seeking treatment for addiction. Oh, yes, by the way, look at the Rocky Mountain High report. Came out a couple of weeks ago, volume eight, uh, suicides, 10 to 19 year old. Do you know what the number one drug in the talks? Of suicide victims in this age group was in the state of Colorado. Well, the number one. 
followed by alcohol, but it wasn't even close. Think about that. Wrap that around. You've been told marijuana never kills. Ask the family of the DEA agent shot on the Amtrak train in Tucson this week. Guess what the two fellows had in their suitcase? Headed back from LA to New Orleans, packaged marijuana, bought it at dispensary, and hundreds of ethanol products. Resulted in the life taken of a DEA agent, and another DEA agent shot, and another uh, Tucson police officer shot. They think they're both going to shot marijuana, never kill anybody. Not at all. Harmless substance. That's what we've been told. I always said, I'm going to throw this in because I kind of shifted because the big argument is this going to take care of our opioid problem. I know that's our argument. Uh, I don't know if y'all have an opioid problem down here. I've got old people probably do. <laughs> if, my part, if my partner said, uh, and I, this is Dale Quigley, so don't get mad at me. He always refers to Florida as God's waiting room. <laughs> so, uh, I don't mean that disparagingly, but... <laughs> Monty, you will attest my tribute to that quote to Dale. I will. Yeah. Will it take care of your opioid problem? Well, if there's any state that this is true, and you have to understand, the research came out 2014, Buck Power uh, took a look at data from states uh, from 1996 to 2010. And after looking at that, he basically came to this group, basically came to the conclusion that a highly regulated medical marijuana industry would reduce opioid use disorder and opioid overdose death by 21 percent that's phenomenal that, and that caught everybody's attention probably heard it down here as a part of your movement it's going to take care of your opioid problem well another group scott et al and Rand corporation said well you know what let's because here we kind of thin 2010 had nine states that monopolized all it west of the mississippi None would experience the opioid pandemic like we had east of Mississippi. So Scott and, and their group and the Rand Corporation said, well, let's take the same methodology that was used by Buck Power, and let's take this forward from 96 to 2017 and see what we find out. And in 2018, they released their results, and guess what they found out? That in the states that medicalized, you didn't see a 21% reduction. You saw a 23% increase in opioid use disorder, opioid overdose deaths. That's a 44 point swing. It ain't going to fix your problem. And if anybody was going to fix it, it would be Colorado. The highest concentration of dispensaries per capita in this country is in the state of Colorado. Absolutely the highest concentration of dispensaries. So if that theory was going to hold true, then this should be the case here. They shouldn't have a problem. They're getting slaughtered in Colorado. Absolutely getting slaughtered. And it kind of gives you a timeline of where that's traveling. These are overdose deaths in Colorado related to that. You can't see that for the function up here. This is the different time, types of folk, that drugs that folks are overdosing on. And more importantly, you look at the percentages that, uh, you know, can't see the top over there, but methamphetamines are up. You have a meth problem in this here? 1700%. Uh, prescription drugs up uh, 300%. Heroin up 51%. And by the way, cocaine's coming back, as you all already know here. Cocaine's on the way, on the way back, and if you're not dealing with it. But this is a state that actually should have just the reverse, but it's not going to fix your problem. Never had it. In every instance, and I told the Hyatt community in 2014 when they hired me that if you think you've got an opioid problem now, wait till we legalize this crap. And in every instance, we've seen this culture. I was even before Buck Bauer and the rest of us. I must be a genius, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. The data is proud. So let's look at some hey, of Ed, Ed, before you leave that subject, this on the opioid thing, this is something no one thinks about. But one of the primary arguments of the marijuana legalizers since the California days is if we legalize, we're going to do away with the drug cartels. We're going to shut down organized crime. Well, guess what's happened? All of those cartels, all of those people selling marijuana, making lots of money, when they start competing with the state, 
for drug proceeds from marijuana. Guess what they did? They moved to they moved to opioids. So the legalization of pot, which has got the state now grabbing those drug profits, they didn't stop. They didn't go away. They're not they're not intimidated by drug legalization. They're emboldened by it. So the opioid problem, besides pot not solving people's addiction problems, it's flooded our streets with this stuff because that's what they moved to. And, and nobody talks about that. Um, it didn't solve anything, either from a, just people using it more, but it's on the street um, because of legalization. Yep. And, and, and it, it's only exasperated the problem and continues to do that, and it does so in every state. And even look to the state of Oregon, when you look at the fact now that they basically decriminalized possession of all substances under certain amounts. You, you can just have it with the cops in the room. Tell me, does it make sense to possess two ounces of cocaine? What would you, what happened in Florida if you had two ounces of cocaine? You go to jail. What about two ounces of heroin? Yeah, what about two ounces of crystal meth? They're going to jail. Not in Oregon, you ain't. That's personal use. And, and uh, if, you, if you think about this, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook fame donated a half a million dollars in Oregon to legalize all drugs. It's part of the public record stuff. Now let's look at some research to support why you're young, why you should be concerned about your young people here. The first was adolescent brain and in the vulnerability to the effects of cannabis. The narrative review, uh, he knows the date is 2020. This isn't old stuff. This is a relatively new stuff. Looked at the impacts to brain development, cognitive imperative, and life outcomes. So what did they find? I'm going to go through this quickly. Key takeaway points. Cognition. Impairment, as we know, we're talking about executive function. Uh, mental processing speed, attention, memory, recall, poor performance, early onset, all adversely impact. Now we're starting to have some research welding into some more higher hopes of stuff here. I already know what the old research is, is the eight to 12%. Now you're seeing executive function in some instances irreversible, even if you, says you stop using weed. You look at brain structure, a reduction of gray matter. And, and Libby Stout, who's an addiction psychiatrist on our speaker bureau, she throws out these MRI images of, of a normal brain with respect to gray matter, and then a young person that is using weed and how much decreased gray matter that is there. And it's stark and it's alarming. And in some instances, depend, depending on potency and frequency, it ain't coming back. It ain't coming back. And this is the reality of today's marijuana. Structural integrity deficits as an adult and the association is to psychosis. Let me tell you something. Cannabis and new psychosis is through the roof in this country. Absolutely through the roof in this country because of high folks in marijuana. And if you have a predisposition to schizophrenia, particularly young people, there's an early onset of schizophrenia. And we all cops dealt with schizophrenic individuals. Oh my gosh, it, it, that's a nightmare in of itself. And, uh, but the early onset of psychosis, THC cannabis induced psychosis is through the roof. Over 18,000 documented instances in Colorado last year alone of cases of cannabis induced psychosis that presented in the weeks of Colorado. 18,000 of them because of high pumps of marijuana. You can wrap, get your mind around that. And lastly, overall risk includes, you know, we know it's fragile, the adolescent brain, reduction in performance, but more importantly, lower IQ. We've already been demonstrating that at lower potency. The, the New Zealand, Australia, eight point reduction in IQ that's not recoverable. I don't know about you, me losing eight point, I'm in trouble. I'm in the back seat of the bus and, and somebody's going to have to get me off the bus. I don't have that many to begin with, but I lose eight points. I don't. The average person can't afford to lose eight points. Now, you're a genius like Monty, eight points ain't gonna hurt you. I start me, he's a dumb cop, eight points is, you know, I'm going over to the dark side because I ain't got enough to do that. I'm serious, you know, that's, that's huge when you look at 
cognition and, and a reduction in IQ. Eight points is a significant loss that is not recoverable even if you stop. And there we are. The prevalence of cannabis use disorder among people who use cat a meta analysis. You know, here, and here I, that's probably not a really good illustration, but it's the best one I got. People understand it because kids learn for you know, you all heard about Russian roulette. You know, I do you take a revolver, you empty all but put one round in it, spin the cylinder, close it. You know, this is what we're talking about with people who use cannabis have a one in five chance of developing cannabis use disorder, one in eight in developing cannabis uh, dependency, and one in three if you use it weekly. Everybody thinks all these kids think they're going to be one of these four. Of you. It ain't gonna happen to me. It's not happening to me. And guess what? It might just be you when that cylinder slot and pull the hammer back. Bang! It's you. But everybody, every kid, every kid goes right back to what we talked about. It ain't there yet. It ain't gonna happen. They're risk takers for a reason. They're risk takers for a reason because they don't know any better. You know, us old guys, you know, we've been around a while. We, I ain't doing that. That's stupid. Now, I'm sure that's why you send the young cops through the door first. They don't know no better. <laughs> They'll go through there. Yeah. Well, you pretend I'll do it. And, you know, they go through the door and this old guy sit back. Yeah, hey, buddy, I already done that. Yeah, well, it, sometimes that doesn't matter. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes the stu stupid old ones still Stupid old ones, yeah, gotta do it. Yeah. But we all think we're going to be one of those four there. It's not going to happen to me. It absolutely ain't going to happen to me. Risk level goes up. Guess what? Higher potency products. Started early age and frequent continuous usage. It goes up. This is with impairment. Granted, and I, I would challenge you anytime you look at really research, look at the end value. How many, how many cohorts are in here? There's not many here, but we've not done a lot of research on impairment uh, with respect to driving, but you know. Uh, two cohorts, 55 with flyer, 66 concentrate. Here's what they used, and guess what they found? Both groups showed impairment. And here's the beauty of this: is impairment for cannabis demonstrates itself differently than alcohol. We have a clear body of science of what alcohol, how the body processes alcohol, metastasizes alcohol, and we, that's why we have presumptive levels in the state. Oh wait, in my state, probably oh wait, your your group presumed go to the influence. I don't know what you got here. In Florida, with respect to an anagram, do you even have an anagram? Or is, I don't think there's a presumption, but wait, well, guess what? There's no science to support any anagram level for impairment. It don't exist. It absolutely doesn't. What we do know is that when, when you're high on alcohol and alcohol dissipates, you find motor skills, all those things that affect you, your coordination, you find motor skills, they start to return the same rate that alcohol dissipates. What we found with cannabis, very first thing it tells you, peripheral. Can't see tunnel vision, but it's all cognition and it doesn't return at the rate. As soon as you stop using the THC, your levels drop dramatically. And that's why it's so important for you guys to get that blood within that first two hour window. And that's why, unfortunately, I never thought I'd see law enforcement agencies are training their officers to do phlebotomy so they can draw blood. Unbelievable. If you had told me in 1979 that we would be drawing blood. And in 2021, I told you, kiss my hind end, you and I are drunk crowd. It ain't happening. And I ain't doing it, but it is happening. Absolutely is happening. Here you go. Verbal recall. I'm going to go through this because I, I want to get on to some stuff here, but this is important. Y'all are going to have this anyway. I'm leaving this PowerPoint. Get it from Michelle. Uh, she's recording. I want you to go to this site, Isaacs. This is a group of physicians. Uh, Ken Fan out of Colorado, pain management doctor, Ron Eat Lab. They started this site. This is a got a host of research under any topical area. Isaac, it's you go to our website too, emi.org. I get that. We're linked to Isaacs. Uh, it's just amazing the research that's out there in any topical area, the brain, the nervous system, the heart, how it cannabis affects that. It's all here on Isaacs. It's just a great website. Physicians are really concerned about what cannabis is doing, what marijuana is doing to their people in their community. Let's talk a little bit about legalization of highway safety because, you know, guess what? Marijuana continues to play an increasing role in traffic collisions and fatality. The latest Colorado data supports that, as does data out of Washington, Oregon, Michigan. Chicago just released, the Chicago Highway just released the first Illinois report that came out last night. Guess what? 
They're seeing an increase uh, in marijuana impaired drivers, it resulting in, in deletions of fatalities in there. So there is no dispute. I'm not saying marijuana legalization has caused that. We're not at causation yet, but there's a clear association and correlation. And the numbers continue to increase every year. Marijuana continues to play a significant role in the involvement of crashes <laughs> and fatalities in this country. It kind of gives you this looks at the uh, combinations cannabinoid only. You look at 42% of the tox screens were cannabinoid only in Colorado. 45% of them were, were uh, alcohol and cannabinoid in Colorado. The combination there and the pitfalls. You know, here's the problem. We've let, there's no uniform. There actually is no, with respect to legalization, oh, there's you no know, uniformity or consistency. I left up to the state. Nobody's done a dang thing about uh, regulating potency in this country. Absolutely not done a thing here. Uh, you know, policies, laws and policies aren't following science. We don't have any science with respect to what impairment looks like, nor is there any roadside detection devices that we have for alcohol for detecting cannabis on the, on the breath or saliva with scientific reliability of the method product. Well, not there yet. Uh, if you want to be the next zillionaire, invent that device and you'll be the zillionaire overnight. You'll, you'll be richer than Zuckerman. You can buy Facebook. And I wish you didn't shut it down. So it'd be the world <laughs> in great favor right there. That's the biggest, stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> White people, I'm going to start. I don't do social media. So, you know, but my kids and grandkids do it. And that's a whole other sermon, but there is absolutely no consistent. Uh, T, when you talk about research, you know, we're still now just starting to test the higher potency products and doing research. The problem is we're still probably five, seven years away from getting those definitive answers. We know they're not going to be good, but uh, if anything goods come out of the legalization, it is research. And this is what it's all about. The commercialization of THC, 37 medical. That includes the district 17 and 48 now in 20 to 30 billion dollar industry. People don't really understand that significance of that number. So I, I you would like to use this illustration that an old organized crime prosecutor kind of told me this a long time ago. Monty probably will appreciate this, but you know, I a million dollars is a lot of money, right? A billion dollars is a whole lot of money. To show you what the difference between a million and a billion, I want I want to. He, this Kentucky Hillbilly is going to be very generous to every one of you. You folks that, that could not be here and they're watching online, you're out of luck. So you don't get no money. Every one of you is getting a million dollars in here. I only got one cash on. You got to spend a thousand dollars a day to the day by cigar. How long before you're broke? You may want to guess. Just shy of three years and you're going to be broke. Three years. And uh, about nine months, you're going to be broke. Get thousand bucks. Same thing for you folks that braved COVID and came here in person. Unlike the rest of you that are online, uh, that didn't, you know, shame on you. No, I'm just joking. You know, <laughs> not really. <clears throat> um, but anyway, I'm going to give you all a billion dollars with the same caveat that you got to spend a thousand dollars a day. Three years, billions gone. How long before you broke? And I guess 2,750 years mm -hmm. and you will be broke. Now wrap that around an industry is making 20 to 30 billion a year. Coupled with the fact that money already alluded to the black market. Anybody want to guess? I can't. The California's against marijuana plant, the eradication segment of the in California. You don't want to know how much this year, let right? me shut down a week ago. How much the love is on process package of one pound bundles of marijuana they seize this year in California? You guess? I didn't think of all of these cases where there's been seizures that are hundreds of thousands of plants in one place and they're all black market. But I don't know the total pound quantity. How about 96 tons in California? 
on the black market side. In the first state to legalize because it would get rid of the black market. In the very first state that would legalize because it was going to get rid of the black market. 96 tons packaged in one pound in California in the black market. This year, this summer, 96 tons headed everywhere in America. It ain't going to get rid of the black market. But this is where we are. Talk about marijuana and school impacts. This kind of gives you an idea. It ain't going. I still love the quote from Cherry Hills superintendent outside of Denver that the only thing marijuana legalization has done for the schools in his, his district is bring more marijuana into the schools in his district. That's that's the best quote I've ever heard from a, a school administrator. Uh, and if you don't think that it's not in your schools, then you are fooling yourself. And I'll show you some stuff later here. Probably our, our SROs are scratching their head, our school resource officers, because of the devices that are being sold to hide these products and to make these products that look like common things will show you. It's amazing what's out there. And uh, But here's the problem. You know, hospitalizations, what? They jump, the, the folks jumped up. Why did they go down? Oh, look at that. We've seen a huge reduction in hospitalizations in 2020. No crap, Sherlock. COVID hit. Nobody was going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, you always got to look at it, but everybody jumps on this and say, well, it's not a significant problem. And they did on this report. Well, hospitalizations went down dramatically. Well, hospitalizations across this country for anything other than COVID went down dramatically in 2020. So you got to always look at research and look at data. And, and, and look at what's the motivation. So we reported as it is, the hospitalizations did go down. They did, there's no disputing that, but nobody went to the hospital. I'm amazed, COVID cured everything. Nobody had appendicitis anymore, nobody had a heart attack, nobody had anything because COVID fixed it up. Even cured cancer, I've been told. Percent of the marijuana exposures from zero to eight years old, you look at these numbers and gee, Lord have mercy. Edibles, guess what, not shocking, that edibles are the number one reason uh, for accidental exposure. A good thing about Colorado and some other states, at least legislation was enacted to change because it used to look like common pills or candy. Now it can't. So if you do anything in this state, and I've told you every time I come down here, make sure that the legislation is a, a factor. You're going to have edible products that do not resemble common children's candy. By gosh, you've already done that. There's no reason that a gummy bear should look like a gummy bear and be medicine. In Colorado, it looks like a little marijuana leaf. That's what they look like. They used to look like gummy bears. They used to look like chocolate chip cookies. They used to look like brownies. They used to look like all the stuff that an eight-year-old cannot distinguish between a THC-infused chocolate chip cookie and one that does, and they eat it and they go to the ED. So you've got to insist that they do not, do not look like common children's candy. It just can't happen because if it does, then this is what's going to happen, which I think all along when you do that, your whole intent is to try to do just that and try something to use that. So not a bad MO. Then we touched a little bit about suicides and the tox in there. You know, when you look at, and look, look at this, right here, this one right here. 10 to 19 year olds. 10 to 19 year olds. How do we get to a point in this country where we have young people that, that don't feel like they have any worth? They get to a point where they don't even feel like, for whatever reason, that their only answer is to take their own life. I, I'm just, it breaks my heart that we are in the shape we are in when we're even happy to talk about an age group like this and they're taking their own life because they see no value in their life. Nobody's put any interest in them. We are failing our children miserably in this country. Not pointing fingers at anybody, we, and I mean collectively, we are failing our young people in this country. They pay a steep price for it. They're going to pay a steep price. We already are. We talked about taxes and budget revenue. That doesn't even hit 1% yet of Colorado General Fund budget. Yeah, but they raised a crap load of money, $387 million. That's all. Policymakers here is this number. We have no idea what's the top of the cost are. No idea whatsoever. But I can't imagine as use continues to climb, it's going to be much different than the alcohol and tobacco numbers. 10 to 1, 15 to 1 ratio for those products. 31 that cost 10, 15. I got a feeling we're probably somewhere 
about half of that, that's a, maybe for every one dollar we take, five or six right now, based on the number of users, but that number continues to grow every year. Reality of where we are, it ain't gonna fix it. So let's talk about him. Move on and try to shut this thing down here. Get money up here. Y'all want to hear a lawyer anyway. <laughs> uh, the history of him. Let me call all these up here because I want to bust through him. Hemp's always been around. And let me let me, let me clarify something right now. I don't know what you got heard about him, but hemp and marijuana aren't cousins. They're identical twins. From a botanical standpoint, there is one species, cannabis sativa L. That's it. Yeah. You got strain, you got indica, sativa, and redox. What hemp always was in this country was a sativa strain. And the sativa strain actually uh, is grows tall, but uh, in typical outdoor eradication plant, what we've done is, is through hybrids, we've crossed the two because what the indica does is it, it creates more biomass. Uh, sativa gets really tall. I'm, I've seen them in Kentucky that are 25 foot tall, but they ain't just big around. Uh, the indica plant's usually about yay tall and looks like a Christmas tree. It has much more biomass. Biomass produces flour, and there you are. But hemp in this country primarily was produced for the bass fibers in the stock. In order to do that, the plant can't do two things. If you plant it close together, then, then it promotes stock growth, and that's where all the fibers are contained. If you give it some separation, you get biomass. And our hemp industry is after biomass because they want to produce CBD. And in order to do that, you have to get flour uh, to do that. So you have to have separation. So there we are. Virtually uh, forgotten the effort and was really a, a decent industry in this country because we used to produce rope and canvas. Before this country's inception, up until the start of the Second World War. But after World War I, what happened? We started importing this thing a heck of a lot cheaper from the Far East into this country that we could produce domestically. And then if you know your world history, you know what happened in the 30s, the onset of World War II, the Japanese started hopping islands. They took over all of our the Philippines, Malaysia, all these countries that we got hemp from. So the federal government in 1937 encouraged the production of hemp because they were fearful of the onset of the Second World War. And then guess what happened during the Second World War? We see a technology explosion. We get petroleum distillates. We get nylon rope. It goes away. Until 2014. And this is what you would see normally a hemp plant. This is tall, thin. They're looking for the stocks. And this is a Kentucky hemp field. This is about a 100 acre hemp field. There's about a million plants in here. And if anybody, anybody aerial spotters, you may notice any really distinct color variations in here. <laughs> I ain't hemp, folks, as far as three tenths of a percent, because hemp designation of an arbitrary designation, three tenths of a percent of less, now makes it hemp. That stuff tested out at 17 plus percent. So anybody says, well, no legitimate, uh, no Ill illicit marijuana grow, whatever. Commingled full crap. Does not affect the current plant. It only affects the next generation should it be pollinated. A perfect vessel for lion, and that's what we're seeing all over this country. All you do is in Kentucky, you go get your pay your $175, get your hemp license, give me your lat long, and you grow whatever the heck you want to grow because we don't have the capacity to quantify THC. And there we are. 2014 Farm Bill, and I told McConnell that this was going to be a debacle, don't do it. He inserts the hemp provision in here uh, because he wants to let research universities and State Department of Agriculture determine the viability of hemp as an agricultural commodity. USDA did that in, in 84, and the University of Kentucky did it in 96 and said there ain't no market for this crap. The Canadians did it, there's no market for this crap. And yet we still did it. And what happens with the Farm Bill every four years, it has to be reauthorized. And in 2018, uh, that was what happened after uh, McConnell did what he did in 14. 2018, the new strategy and this changed everything. The hemp provision in the 2018 Farm Bill uh, that the president signed in December uh, 18 
basically views him separately from marijuana at a three tenths of a percent designation or less. Now views it as an agriculture commodity, removes it from the purview of the DEA and the FDA, brings it over to the United States Department of Agriculture and the FDA. And they treat it much like you all treat oranges down here and watermelons. Cops don't stop watermelon trucks. The trucks going up and down the road. Hemp is now an agriculture commodity. What a flip of that. And I had conversations with uh, McConnell's people and said this is going to be the worst law enforcement debacle. And essentially what they've done is, is overtly legalize marijuana as a medical weapon. Because there is no distinction visually. Mahmoud El Salee at the University of Mississippi Natural Products Lab. He has been licensed by the DEA since 1979 to grow and test marijuana under license of the DEA for NIDA. I bring him to Kentucky and I said, tell me the difference between this field and this field. One's illicit, one's hemp. Yeah. Visually distinguished between the two, he said, I can't hear the name of the same tenants of that is marijuana. You can only do that through laboratory analysis. And as far as I know, you're safe to do that yet. Absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. And it prohibits any state from stopping the lawful interstate transportation of hemp. Regardless of whether Mississippi or South Dakota don't allow hemp, I can still take my tractor trailer load of hemp through your state and you can't do a thing about it as long as I'm properly licensed. Well, these cops in here, what a better vessel for co-mingling illicit narcotics or money traveling east or west, north and south than the guys of hemp. Neuters your drug dogs and what a debacle. I was telling Monty a conversation uh, right during COVID with an Arizona trooper outside of uh, Phoenix on the interstate with 20,000 pounds of Kentucky hemp. His dog alerted it as he passed the semi in the car. The dog went nuts in the car, smelled it, and pulls him over and gets a hold of me and he's got all the proper paperwork. He said, What do I do? He said, I already know. I said, That's another PC. He's legal. Under the 2018 Yes, sir. And then Ed, there's going to there's starting to be a push now that I've seen over the last couple of weeks that um, some ordinance, some people want to get rid of drug dogs altogether. Well, and, and you know, well tool. yeah, and, and that, that is, uh, you know, here, here's the problem. Every canine in this country, the very first, when you start to train canine, the very first drug they learn, they'll learn on the Olfactory, it's the easiest for them to learn. The problem with the dog is, unless your Florida dogs are smarter than Kentucky dogs, they, they don't have the ability to tap once for three tenths of a percent, <laughs> tap twice for more than three tenths. Don't, you can't have, you can't unlearn that in the dog. My advice to your departments is don't train them to learn on weed. Do not train them to learn on weed. But the knee jerk reaction of everybody's got to get rid of your canine from. You don't have to. You got to be very specific with your policies and and you have to do your due diligence as a supervisor over these units to make sure they're not drive drugs. They can still be a valuable tool, but it makes it much more difficult as a resource to you in a state that is medicalized and or in this product. Yes. But here we are. And now we got, I got to color this one purple. We got uh, 48 states that are hemp. It's all about this crap. It's all about the oil. Absolutely all about the oil. These products, I mean, in every shape, form, or fashion. You can't go into 7 Eleven. You can't, I can go to my Walmart in Kentucky because we got end products. I can go to the Walgreens. I can go to the 7 Eleven, and they're just stacks and stacks of hemp. CBD products that are quote unquote hemp related are really real. And what we have found out in limited testing is. There's virtually no CBD in these products. Like I said, four tenths of one percent is the highest that we've seen of a product that's supposed to be high concentrated CBD and THC is much in excess of three tenths of that. It's a huge problem for the consumer who is taking it on face value, and understanding the FDA is not substantiated or supporting any of the claims from these individuals who are selling this. Not one of them. There is only one approved CBD product by the FDA, and that's epidiolic. That's it. Epidiolex, uh, there used to be GW Pharmaceutical. Uh, they went through the, the clinical trials in the FDA, the five-step process. 
and in, 20, uh, in July of 18, uh, the FDA signed off on it. And in September of 18, the DEA made it a Schedule Two. They since reduced it down to a Schedule Five. Then last year, they removed it from the schedule. Still, it's the only substance that a doctor can legally prescribe outside. Of, that's the first plant-based, plant-based, plant-derived cannabidiol product. Now we had Marinol and some other, but it's the very first. This is the very first substance. This is medical marijuana. This is how we do medicine in this country. And by all means, we should exploit every cannabinoid within marijuana. And we should put it through the trials at the college range. Designed to treat the very narrow spectrum of pediatric seizure disorders, uh, but it's still the, the, the number one side effect is elevated liver function. If you're using a CBD product and you're going to eventually have liver issues out of this, but if I'm a parent of a child that's seizing 60 to 80 times a day and it can reduce seizure levels to single digits, that's just a, a risk to Lord. But you know that. That's why you get that prescription. It's got 37 pages. Two paragraphs tell you what the drug, how good the drug is for you. The other 36 pages tell you what to watch out for. That's how we do medicine in this country. But you as a patient determine the efficacy and safety of the products you're about to consume. Hey, and on that subject, Idaho was part of the research on that. Our governor established a pilot program to help the FDA. And this is when everybody was saying CBD cured pediatric epilepsy, all kinds of things. As they were studying that, a third of the kids had some benefit. A third of the kids, it didn't help them at all, but there was a significant number. It hurt the child. And so through the process, they get the dosages right. They figure out what age, weight, all that stuff to get the dosages and the particular illnesses and they were able to create this FDA drug. But you got parents out there giving kids this stuff and it could be hurting them. And, and, and if not hurting them, it could be doing nothing and they're not taking other medicines because they think this is a, a wonderful thing. Yeah. But so, you, when you think about it, what, tell, tell me another drug where you actually as a patient get to determine what type of drug you're going to take with respect to not only what type, how often you got to take. I don't know about you. I get, I get, well, I take this two times a day, once in the morning after a meal and once in the evening after a meal. And it's, here's the milligram dose you're supposed to take. Well, no, you would now, as a patient with this, decide, okay, I'm going to take this because we've got blood tenders. And we, we've sent some, uh, our female the officer then posing as pregnant women. Asking my tender to tell them I'm not obligated, uh, I'm pregnant. Uh, what do you recommend? I need to smoke this or you take this. <laughs> are you kidding me? And, you know, this is this is where we are. You know, so you as a patient get to decide the frequency and the amount you take. And uh, you know, to me, when you go in here and you look at medicine and marijuana, of course, I challenge you every time everywhere I go, I said, you know. You go into these dispensaries and, and there's a line in the counter. The left side is medical and you have to have a card in that state. You have to be 18, have a card, a recommendation, have a card holder. And the right side is commercial. All you got to do is be 21. You don't even have to be a rep. And you look at the product and they're identical. And so, so I've asked the question, all right, that's medical marijuana. What's the difference? No difference. It's the same stuff. So when you leave out of here, go down to Walgreens or Walmart and ask the pharmacist for the recreational purpose that you want to take. <laughs> yeah. So you said, so CBD that you guys have tested uh, doesn't really have CBD in it. So what does have it? What is the main thing? THC. So when you talk about medicinal THC, well, we have that here in Florida. Would that just be CBD? Is the medicinal part, and then the THC is just the part that they do not. There's nothing. Well, here, here's here's the problem. If, if if there's going to be of the 113 cannabinoids, and I'm talking about the people that I've talked to at NIDA uh, and NIH, and uh, the researchers, Dr. Mahmoud El Soli, that have been doing this, if we're going out of the 113 cannabinoids, the cannabidiol, the CBDs are probably the one that holds the most promise for medical value. The problem is what we've done in this country is we've read CBD out of marijuana because CBD serves one purpose. When God put this plant here, there's one principal purpose. CBD 
cannabis diaz actually attach to the CD1 receptors in the brain. And when they attach, they block Delta 9's ability to attach. So you can't get high. And what we saw in the 60s and 70s was marijuana that had a very close molecular ratio. I mean, talking about CBD to THC ratio is very close. And what's important about that, as long as that ratio is very close, two or three to one, you can roll a joint as long as this table. And I don't care. If you cheat and chong it all you want, you ain't going to get high because CBD will block that. So what we've done is we've bred it out while conversely breeding THC through the root. So we lack that capacity. There was some research done, and I was at NIH when this was presented, and uh, 15 researchers at UC Berkeley and UC San Diego with respect to the analgesic benefit of THC as a, a substitute for opioids. And they were testing at 1.7, 3.9, and 7% THC. The researchers, of course, they had a very small cohort because you can't do blind placebo testing because you know you're high. You know, you, know, you just know you're high. I mean, there's no way up. If you're a pothead, you know you're high. You know, this, this, this ain't even weed. So, you know, it is what it is. So it's very difficult to blind test on this. But anyway, here's what I found was very interesting about that. Even this left-leaning researcher basically said, look, first and foremost, and here he is a bunch of scientists talking, said, you got to figure out a better deal because smoke and vaping isn't how we should be administering this substance. It's a horrible delivery device. It's detrimental to the end user. There's so many other things in this product that we don't know that would far outweigh any medical. But here's what I found was great. Do you know what level of THC he said was the highest you should be using for an analgesic benefit? 3.9%. He said anything over that, the harmful consequences of prolonged exposure to THC would outweigh any analgesic benefit of THC at 3.9%. So if there is going to be medical benefit, it's probably going to come from the cannabidiol, but we still got to do what, what they did with every dial. We got to put them through the trial. Of the 113, I'll stand here and tell you, the 113 cannabinoids, if we can find 70 of them that have legitimate medical value and are put through that process, I'd be 100% supportive of that. 100 percent so, um with our heads around the thc part because if you really are medicinal you wanted to use it why would you do that why? you don't there you go why 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 if you've got a, a bad knee why do you need a oc80 because when, when an ibuprofen would do that's a point two percent cbd wouldn't do anything for you anyway it's got fillers it's got it's it's fake because it's expensive to produce, so there isn't much in there. And this stuff that comes from everywhere, I mean, who knows who makes it that's in the store? It's got molds, mildews, pesticides, other things. It's, it's just crazy. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, snake oil stuff. It doesn't mean it doesn't have some value if it's in the right dosage and tested, but this stuff that's being sold is. I guess, I guess it, it illustrates my where, where we are today with marijuana is where we are in this country in the turn of the last century before the FDA. And by the reason the FDA came into play, food and drug and cosmetic act, because we had 48 states regulating food, drug, and cosmetic industry the way they saw fit. There was no uniformity, there was no consistency, and there was no oversight. And people were dying right and left because of pain food, pain and medicine. And that's why we had the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. That's where the FDA came from. That's where we are today with marijuana. The Wild West of marijuana. Money's exactly right. It's the Wild West with respect to regulatory. Because nobody is doing anything to effectively regulate this industry. I don't care how well intended they sound. And then we told the bunch of South Dakota. You're going to screw the folks too, because everybody else has. It's just the way the system is set up. The industry is driving it, they're riding it, and they will do the same there. And there's no federal oversight or intervention whatsoever at all. 
And that's why FDA came into play. It's the wild west of wheat right here. And you got this goofball right here. And, you know, San J goofball. I like to throw a punch, but you know, I can't do that. But, uh, here we are. Charlotte's Web, the guys who started this mess, these were illicit marijuana growers out of California that started making CBD in their basement. And now they have, supposedly have a high strain of CBD and guess what? Well, man, you can be out in for buyer beware. And you don't know what you're getting because you ain't getting what you're selling. And none of it has been substantiated, supported by FDA clinical review for trial. None. It's, I mean, you know, I say you can find it for anything. I mean, Lordy Mercy, Lip Long, man, you know, it, you name it. It'll, it'll fix anything. I'm just here to tell you. Then you got this mess. This is the latest, greatest phrase out of him. Delta 8. Delta 8 is one of the host of uh, uh, cannabinoids, uh, the tetrahydrocannabinol cannabinoids. That you're the only one you really ever heard of, Delta 9. That's what he's now. But Delta 8 is being, uh, is, is now being reported to be the latest, greatest thing out there, driving it from the hemp industry. Because now, what the, you, the unique thing about this is it doesn't matter in your state what you got, medical or commercial. As long as you are a hemp state, you can produce this crap. And basically what they did when they legalized hemp at three tenths of a percent is they removed from the state, they removed the entire plant and all of its compounds, compounds and components from the schedule. And you know what? It's not so much, there's not a lot of Delta A in hemp. So what they're doing is they're doing a distillation process and they're concentrating it. The problem that we're seeing across the country with Delta 8, the most significant problem is not so much the concentration of Delta 8, it's the distillation process or the extraction process or the solvents being used. Most reputable production facilities in these state use CO2 as the principal solvent for extraction. What we are finding out in these mom and pa shops that are hemp producers, uh, they are using, and we even found uh, bleach as a extraction solvent. Most of the problems caused, the adverse reactions caused by Delta-8 are more in the distillation process to synthesize Delta-8. And it's the solvents that are being used that are causing the host of problems as opposed to Delta-8. And this is an evolving process we at NMI are getting ready to push out a bulletin on this, uh, not only to our Hyde community, but out to our DFC and prevention partners. Trying, this is relatively new. I mean, you're talking about a substance in the, the last few months that's evolved in, into the uh, forefront of the, of the uh, hemp and CBD movement. And uh, we're still learning a lot about this process, but what we are finding out is most of the adverse reactions are coming from the uh, the distillation process in in this to try to concentrate that day. but you know it, it's presenting some huge health risk and it comes in again it's about every kind of form imaginable mainly gummies or the primary delivery device here uh, is a gummy thing uh, you know I heard something about gummies I don't know what it is <laughs> any of y'all eat gummies in here gummy baby there you go mm -hmm. yeah I mean <laughs> I used to think only kids ate gummies, but I'm finding more and more. I don't eat gummies, so it must be something, you know, the chewing rubber. So, you know, <laughs> my, my thing's pretty good. More and more, I used to have nobody admit it to it, but now everybody's raising their hands up. You know, but it, the gummies seem to be, and here's our culprit. And, and Ed talked to you earlier about, uh, you know, what scientists do when they genetically modify and engineer. This is a Washington medical marijuana plant. I don't think Washington's growing season is quite as robust as Florida's growing season. This is an outdoor medical marijuana plant that we went on a compliance check. Uh, the individual caregiver here uh, is allowed to have six plants per person that he's caring for. This individual with six plants over his allotted. This guy right here, uh, they call him the cookie monster. He's about six four. This plant yielded and we dry weighted this, this plant yielded over 22 pounds of processed cell phone. The old DEA adage in an outdoor plant would yield about a pound, a pound and a half, indoor about a quarter pound is out the window because this is what happens when, and this is what you see. 
typically when you allow home grows and outdoor production is these monstrosity hybrid plants. This is a hybrid indica sativa that yields over 22 pounds of processed sellable flour here. But it never ends. It never ends. These things here, we're getting close, and this is the greatest, latest craze with our young people's vaping devices. And they vape for a reason. Uh, they vape because of the stealthiness, because you have no way of discerning whether they're vaping nicotine or they're vaping THC. Absolutely no way. It's odorless. Uh, there's no way, actually, unless you test uh, the oil in there to determine exactly what for they're doing a combination of both. Uh, and uh, this is it. And it's absolutely the craze with our young people. They're vaping all of they, they They don't really understand, even the nicotine vapors, don't really think they're not smoking. Well, you're ingesting an aerosol, not a vape. You're taking an aerosol in. I can't imagine. And we know that with the eval cases, it's not going to be a good outcome. Of course, eval went away with COVID too, so we don't really know that. But here, here's what you got. There's some examples. But here, I took a picture in a, a dispensary. You know, look at this. Why do you have, what is it? I mean, what if it's a high, no, it's a baby device. If you were an SRO or you were, and if you, I got two, my oldest two grandkids live with me. My daughter got divorced, moved in, you know, mother in law's in the basement. Jeez, Lord, what about <laughs> I'm glad we <laughs> <that. laughs> <So, laughs> And I want you to know, Michelle, I, I am here on my 42nd wedding anniversary today. Oh. Uh, so, so I am here. So, yeah, so uh, I just how much I care for you. you know? <laughs> My wife's not too pleased, but you know, but you know, why do you, I, why do you sell these? Well, we know kids are going to get them and they need a way to, to, to be able to do their weed without anybody catching. Mm -hmm. On and believable. But they're there and the flavor and, and I'm back down here. Here's the eval. That's the latest I had. You know, that's a 2020, uh, you know, it's not maybe. Talk, uh, Bill Lynch, he's one of our pharmacists and one of our speakers, a subject matter expert on baby. And he starts to show you the pictures of the, the lungs of, from these folks, it's young kids there. And by chance, if you are a vapor, particularly what we, he found out in his hospital in New Jersey, by the way, uh, and, and what they found out there during COVID that uh, your outcome. You're significantly more likely to contract COVID if you're a THC vapor, and the detrimental outcome is threefold worse if you're a THC vapor from COVID. Uh, so, and yeah, did did go well for during COVID for uh, vaping, and particularly THC vapors that contracted uh, COVID. Again, it's in everything. So let's summarize this so we can move on. It's regardless of your position, you know, I don't. Where you stand on legalization, you might think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I don't think anybody can dispute the fact that we absolutely need that research on this stuff. The good thing about it, and, and what Dale and I always say, if there's anything good that's coming out of legalization, is that it is actually occurring. The downside to it, we're still a few years away from getting some definitive results, but yet we continue to go down this road. Public health, public safety, public policy decisions that are made void of science and research. All we're saying is let the science and the research catch up with the myths. And then you can make your decision based on science and research, whether you want to go down the track trail or not. We're at all time, posies at all time highs. I mean, I don't know how you get much higher than 99 and a half percent. I really don't. But they continue to evolve flour uh, to where we're at the, the mid 40 range with flour, which you told me in 1979. That that I would see raw flour 40 plus percent of your smoking dough. That can't happen. And, but it has. And that's what happens when you hire PhDs in there and they do what they do. What do they do with wheat? And they've done with everything else in this country. Uses rates are higher than in legal states than they are none. And uh, unfortunately, our 12 to 17 group is on its way back up after about four or five years of decline. It's starting to age back up. The, 18 to 25 year olds continue to progression upward. So does 26 and above. We continue to normalize, marginalize this uh, to the point where not a lot of people see anything really harmful about this at all. 
hemp is a nightmare. We already talked about CBD, no research, and very little CBD in it. The normal referral mechanism for treatment is pretty much null and void because of decrim. We're not seeing people in the system. Uh, marijuana's involvement in accident increases. We know it's not uh, marijuana use for, for kids ain't going to be a good thing. Cannabis use disorder goes up. It does cause impairment. And it continues to play an increasing role in all of the crashes and, and fatalities. And will continue to play an increasing role. And we're, we're hamstrung in law enforcement because really we need their, uh, a DRE, drug recognition experts to successfully tackle this. Most departments lack. I think the last data I saw was uh, uh, 16,000 departments in this country have no DREs at all. 16,000. We all have. We have one, and there's probably, I can count on my head how many we have. Well, wow. <clears throat> and they probably hopping from one to the next. So, God bless you. Young brain is developing and marijuana causes damage. Youth is being the market. They are the target, they are the market, make no mistake about it. Uh, in order to be successful, this industry has to addict young people, and that's exactly what they're doing. And they continue to do. And I always throw out one of my favorite authors, and you've probably seen if you've seen me, you've seen this, because this is so true. What gets us into trouble, not what we don't know. So what we know for sure, yes, I am sorry. <laughs> And there is so much about this substance. So, your challenge and your job is to educate yourself to the reality of today's market so that you can go out into your community, and Monty's going to touch on that more, and you can influence the movers and shakers in your community with the facts and information about the reality of today's market. Because it should concern each and every one of us, whether you're a parent or not, that our young people are the target and our young people are adversely impacted. And I have five grandkids, and I usually show them a picture. And they were reading that do what they were reading out here on 42 instead of with my wife. Uh, because it's that important that I look at it in their, in their eyes and I say, you know what? What are we doing to you all? What are we doing to you, and how are you going to have the quality of life that I have based on what we are doing as a society with respect to substance use and substance use disorders? Absolutely frightening, too, that it should concern me. This is our website, completely revamped, revised. Uh, it's got a host of information, dnmi.org. It's a link to Isaacs and some other sites up there. Uh, is we just got about anything you want. I, we're very proud of this website. We get a lot of compliments on its utility. Uh, we actually are, believe it or not, we're entering into social media. Uh, probably, <laughs> yeah, much to my chagrin. I don't know nothing about it. I got a youngster that does all that. <laughs> we're loading content right now onto, we're going to be on uh, Twitter and Instagram is, is DNMI underscore EDU. And then Facebook is just National Marijuana Initiative. So or Twitter, Instagram. They're not active yet, but if you go to those, you can find us. Where I've got to get my social media policy past my board in two weeks and sign off on it. We hope to do a last email out here sometime in the end of October. Inviting all of y'all to find us on Instagram, Twitter, and like us, whatever you want to say. Like and share it. <laughs> Whatever you do with that crap, <laughs> just, just do it and send it out to your contacts. And uh, as the research emerges, we're going to be blasting stuff out and hopefully it'll be a benefit to you. Here's our site. Here's a uh, little QR code here. You can take your phone. This is about this presentation. If you don't like it, press don't, let me know. Uh, if you like to hear something different, let me know. Uh, and you can put on our mic. Have uh, Michelle bring me back on the cool. Yeah. Yeah. Come back again, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. Lady six degree. And lastly, this is us. If you need us, here we are. Me and Dale. It's us. It's AMI. We're old narcs. We answer our phone twenty four seven. We don't have the answer. I got geniuses like mommy that know the answer. We reach out to them. We will respond to you. It's probably better 
email or text us. Uh, and if you need anything, if there's something on our site you can't find or some a particular topic you're interested in, we'll find it for you. We've got to go to our speakers bureau. We've got a host of speakers out there that are free to you. We send like I'm paying for mine to come down here. So, you know, we, he's free most cases. Uh, but that's a resource to you. So lastly, I just I just want to leave you with uh, just a couple of words of encouragement. You know, I I, I am uh, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, I, I love a quote from uh, Winston Churchill when he talked about what was happening at the onset of the Second World War and all the things that that uh, England, Great Britain was was dealing with. And you know, he's talking about you know life has every life has difficulties. And the, the, the pessimist will only fo focus on those difficulties. You can't move past the difficulties. Uh, the optimist sees an opportunity. I think we have to see the opportunities. And it may be, may be overwhelming. And it may seem insurmountable. But I, I firmly believe that eventually this country is going to ride itself and the pendulum is going to change. Enough of this just to have to hold steadfast to the belief that right is right and we should keep it moving right because that's the right thing to do. So, God bless each and every one of you for what you do. And again, thank you for the privilege and opportunity to come here to the Bureau and talk to you all again. I really appreciate it. God bless y'all. Okay. From, yeah, uh, does, anybody, work does anybody have any questions here? Because I do have three online. Okay. okay, so first of all, we'll forget that. The first question is, have we ever seen a business model that truly worked in the marijuana business, sustainable, longevity, longevity, et cetera? Well, if you talk about a business model where you're making money, if you're talking about a business model from a regulatory standpoint, no, we do not. So it's kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding, that if you're talking about a business model that's usually profitable, they have that model. But if we're talking about a regulatory compliance model, Colorado has touted the seed to sale mechanism is touted as the, the most highly regulated and effective model in this country. And it fails abysmally with respect to mitigating these consequences I put up here, public health, public safety, and other issues. So to answer that question, from a regulatory standpoint, nobody has done a good job in mitigating the unintended consequences of legalization. From a business standpoint, from the industry itself, they're doing a hell of a job making money. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure the intent. I think it was the latter as opposed to the former, but yeah. You know. Okay. Next question Do we have data on the amount of people who have gotten pulled over and tested positive for marijuana, or is that something in this study? Uh, there, yeah, you could go to, you could go to the, uh, the impact report sites on our, on our website. Go to the resource tab and look at Colorado's got data in there. Oregon's got data on the number of folks that have been stopped and arrested for marijuana, DUID involving marijuana. Uh, Illinois just released their report last night. It's got data in there. The problem is, is everything state specific. We, we're, we're lacking a national perspective. So we, we at NMI are kind of looking at, and I think that's one of the big projects we're going to undertake next year, is taking all of this state data and compiling it and doing a national composite look in these areas that I alluded to on, on here and how marijuana is impacting public health and public safety from a national perspective. Yeah, you have to go individually and dive in and you can find that on the impact reports on our site, bnmi.org. Go to the resource tab, look at the impact reports and you can go into the executive summary and you can find that data in there. Okay, great. And the last question, how can we build local awareness that marijuana is addictive? It seems to be the strongest sticking point in my experience. Addicts don't know or believe they have an addiction. No, I mean, I think the reality of the situation, you, you, once you're there, uh, you, you lose the ability to acknowledge that you have a problem. And you can't get help until you acknowledge you have a problem. I think it's incumbent upon us to actually speak and here's what I here's what kids tell me all over the country. The scare crap don't work with them. And, and we work with CAFCA, the youth leadership in CAFCA, every year. And they tell us over and over again, just tell us the truth. 
about marijuana. And I tell you, the most effective mechanism, and I know you have them here, is peer to peer, is finding that youth that's had that experience and having that youth relate that experience to their peers. I find that's the most impactful and important message. You know, they don't like to listen to a 65 year old cop tell them why they should be doing this. They want to hear one of their peers talk about that experience. And I tell you, you got to hear it this county. It's just a matter of identifying them and, and emboldening that individual to stand up. And I'm going to tell you something. There's something about this drug that really astounds me. And Monty, you know, Monty's investigated some really bad news. I have, I've been treated worse by this industry than major cocaine. Yeah, multi-state. I mean, they treat me with more respect than the marijuana. I mean, it's, it's, so it's hard sometimes to sit up here and champion right when you're getting eviscerated by this industry because you're just the demon weed advocate. But like I said, you know, I think your best method is, is trying to find that youth advocate and engaging youth in your coalition. They're so important is to, is to for, I think one of the missing links in what we see in groups across this country, DFC's prevention group, is there's two entities that I see that are noticeably absent. One safe base, which astounds me, and the other is youth. I think they ought to be on your boards. You, you ought to have a voice on your board. We're going to talk a lot about that. All right, well, I don't want to steal money's thunder. No, we're no, we're no, like-minded no. like on that. I think they're huge in moving the needle with young people is that peer-to-peer -peer conversation. We get that all the time from you. It's not a good thing. Oh, it's, it's, well, see, you got to understand, too, if we're not engaging them in the platform for paying attention because if you're not Snapchat, you're not Instagram and you know, what TikTok is, but you ain't never gonna see me dance on TikTok. That, <laughs> that just ain't happening. Oh, but on. you know, if, if we're not engaging them where they're paying attention, uh, you know, if you've got a child, you know, you express an interest in marijuana on these platforms, it's 40 to 60 impressions every day they're getting. Um, well, think about that. 99% of them are factually incorrect. But we've got to hit them with their peers and we have to hit them on the mechanism. That's one of the things we're trying to work with at Cat Youth. How do we message in the platform that kids are paying attention to? Because if you're not messaging on their platforms, you're not reaching. If you think you're going to get them on Facebook, you're a dinosaur. They don't pay attention to Facebook. But if you're not Snapchat and Instagram and the way they love Snapchat, it disappears. And do whatever they want on that thing. Zing, it's gone. So they think it's on, but it ain't really. You just have a lot to give it. But anyway, that's, I think that's it. Peer to peer, being truthful, and finding that champion that, that can talk to them in that group. Is that it, Michelle, for the question? That's for online, yes. Thank you all very much. God bless you. Thank you. We'll come back at 11 15, and then, Monty. You'd be ready to start. Ready? Did, I, did I go over, Monty? Did, you say? Did, I, did I go over, man? You're supposed to sing down, man. Yeah. All right, listen, Frank. You, you're you talk all day. It's awesome. It's all yeah. You're supposed to sing me down. No, no. Oh, damn. Let's see, where am I? Oh, before you jump on. Just... So.
Well, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, are we ready or do you want to? Michelle, you want you want to get it? Um, just real quick, just a, before we get money on it, money, I'll be quick. I apologize. Um, I wanted to stress before the importance of what we're talking about here. Um, I wear this little band here. Um, that's for um, the Densky Termidor. Um, he passed away April 30th of this past year in, in front of all his senior uh, fellow senior students at St. Edward School. Well, um, and uh, my son was there, my daughter, who also goes to the school, and unfortunately, I was there as well as a parent on their last day, official last day before graduation, to celebrate them moving on from their senior year to entry into college. They jump in, they all do their ceremonial leap into the lagoon, and unfortunately, BP didn't resurface. Well, come to find out, all through that day, he was under the influence of marijuana oh, and also alcohol. So it's very important things of that nature to always remember that even though, as Ed said, this is sometimes for most of us, it doesn't seem like a big deal, marijuana use or you know, those things that we need to be always cognizant of the dangers of, of this drug. So. All right, Monty Styles. Thank you, sir. Monty, you ready to go? I'm ready. To All go. right, thank you, yes, sir. sir. So great. Those of you viewing from home, you need to understand that you may only only see these empty tables, but there's thousands of people. <laughs> <laughs> They're just—it's like church. They all want to sit in the back row. So, uh, so just ignore all this because Ed's in high demand as a speaker. So lots of people came. So anyway, I'm very excited to be here. It's been a long time since I've been in Florida. I came here a lot when you guys were fighting the initial um, legalization issues. I worked with the Sheriff's Association and other people. I was very tuned in to what was happening and why and who was doing what. But that hasn't been the case recently. I, I actually prefer to do this kind of presentation. I, I could speak for eight hours on all the stuff. Ed, the, the, I don't know what Ed knows, but I, I know more than I wish I knew. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a topic that deserves a lot more attention. We need to spend more time on it. But I get to talk about a happier thing today. And that is, what do we do as concerned members of the community, and especially as community coalitions, that convince people to pay attention to what we're telling them? How do we motivate people to do something? Because for any societal change to happen, people have to feel a sense of urgency or nothing changes. And unless you can instill that sense of urgency or they discover it on their own, like who, who do you find in prevention a lot of times is people have had tragedies in their lives. Uh, they, they, they've experienced that and they have this sense of urgency to do something about it. So how do we do that? How do we get other people to pay attention? Because all of this pot stuff, all of the harms that are caused in society are because people make choices. They make choices to make money. They make choices to get tax revenue. They make choices to get high. It, it, it's people's choices. And so I, one of the things I, I thought about, and I've been working with these wonderful ladies for what, a year and a half now as we've gone along, one of the things I realized, especially last night as they're reviewing your website and your Facebook page and stuff, is you guys, you guys know how to do all of this stuff. And probably before COVID hit, you were doing even more things than I see right now. But I, when I looked at your stuff and knowing these people, these wonderful people, you, you've got it all down. It, it's probably more of a question of how to scale up, how to get more people involved. But I love this mission statement. I love these two words, empower and mo mobilize, educate, activate. That's something I love to talk about. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest something to you though, that, um, and, and I see other things that make me realize that this isn't the case, but to, to reduce the use of alcohol, marijuana, other drugs, Indian River County youth, okay? 
the youth, when they see that, they often think, in a lot of coalitions, they think, oh, we're the problem. Adults all think we're the problem. We got to be fixed. Most common thing that happens to me when I get a call from somebody around the country that want me to come, most common call, Monty, can you come to uh, Tampa Bay and uh, talk to our kids? And I'll go, well, when is it? Okay, yeah, no, I can come there, but uh, what is it you want me to do? So I'm gonna paraphrase what they want. Uh, we want you to come and fix our kids. Oh, okay. So if, if I come to your schools and talk to them for an hour, will this fix them? Oh, well, no. Okay, so why are you bringing me all the way from Boise if I don't accomplish anything? Well, oh, you know what it boils down to? So it boils down to a check mark in a lot of places. Red ribbon week, something, it's a check mark. We gotta have a youth speaker. And so this always launches a conversation and often an hour of con what do you really want to accomplish? And what it ends up is I say, look, if you're going to have me come to Tampa Bay or wherever, use me up, fill the day, fill two days, use me up at other things that are useful because your kids don't want to be, they don't want to feel like they're the problem. Because if we, if it's actually an hour talk, Fix all of your kids. That'd be awesome. But it would have fixed drug problems in your community? No, because a bunch of adults are making these choices. And why do you think our kids are doing it? Because they watch adults make choices. They, they have models, modeling. They, they adopt attitudes about these things. So I, the bottom line is I say, okay, if you want me to come, I'll come, but we need to do these things. I'll talk to your kids, but I have to talk to your community stakeholders or you're wasting your time. If you, if we cannot get your community stakeholders, and I'm not talking about just coalitions, I love talking coalitions, but if we can't get your community stakeholders to understand what is happening and why and what the solutions are and to give them a sense of urgency the people who make laws and policies and budgets, if we don't convince them, if we don't educate, if we don't motivate, if we don't empower them with information, nothing changes because they don't financially support the things that work. They don't understand and make laws and policies that are counterproductive to what they don't support coalitions. So community stakeholders is usually my number one thing. Get me before, and they, they go, well, they won't come. Well, you can do that, but usually it's not a coalition member that gets those people to show up. Best way to get community stakeholders together is to get a mayor or a sheriff or somebody in the community that has a lot of juice. And instead of you as a coalition member saying, oh, please come to our drug education thing, the mayor's calling, hey, Mr. Businessman, Mr. Kwanis brother, Mrs. So-and-so. <coughs> I personally need, or I'm asking for a favor. I need you to be at this meeting for our community. We're going to talk about important things. Could you do that for me? So instead of getting a few to show up, please come to a coalition meeting. No, this is a community stakeholders meeting. And we need the mayor, councilmen, county commissioners, sheriff, school board, and, uh, school board superintendents, um, parents, uh, churches. We need those people. The people that have had this lots of influence. And if you get them here and we, the stuff Ed explained, things that I tell them, by the time they're done, they're going to understand something they have not paid much attention to, is they're going to understand the tremendous amount of misery and pain that's in this community, and they're going to understand reasons why that exists. And they will be motivated, but they have to get in there. Our coalitions too often spend months and months advertising a drug education event at the high school on a Thursday night. How many times you spent a month <coughs> doing that? And you get eight parents there and you've got 10 people on the panel. It happens all the time. You have to figure out how to scale things up. One, that's one way. The other way is to go where the people are. And uh, actually, that's going to be in a slide. Uh, I'm 
I'm going to talk about here in a sec. But you guys, all these programs, this is, you have such an impressive website. I love it. It looks cool. There's all kinds. It's just so well done. Who puts that all together? Well, we work together. It's awesome. Anyway, I can show you page after page. But your Facebook page is cool. But it's all very cool. That you've got youth groups. I know, like everywhere, trouble getting kids to re-engage. Guess what? You guys did this group. There's what 27 kids coming now. 29. 29. And uh, two weeks ago, you're been happy probably with seven. So it's <laughs> awesome. awesome. And those kids, I get to. I, you guys didn't ask me to talk to your kids. How, how much time did I spend begging you let me talk, talk to kids? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're happy now, but that wasn't the original plan. So I get to talk to your kids, and frankly, it's way, it's way more important than this. Not because you aren't important, because you absolutely are. But if we can spark additional interest in those kids, it's going to change everything. So these are the these are the ladies I've been able to work with. So everything I think about your coalition before now was based on working with these three wonderful ladies, and now I get stuck to me others and people that are fighting over who gets to be the chairman and all that. It's pretty fun. No, there's no fight. Yeah, okay. So, so just, just, there's no fight. just a little bit of background because when you talk to a group, before they, you have to establish some credibility for what you say. And, and how I know what I know is important. I don't have a degree in education. I don't have a degree in, in I have a law degree, but I've spent 30 years in law enforcement as in charge of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force for the feds. And that meant DEA, FBI, U.S. Marshals, state and local marks. And our job was to identify, investigate, and prosecute the biggest, baddest, meanest, nastiest drug trafficking organizations we could have. And that included everything from LA street gangs to cartels, international drug smugglers. And over that period of time, I saw a lot of bad things. I grew up in a really wonderful home in a little farming community in Idaho. Uh, not much bad happened there. I lived a, a really wonderful life as a kid. But when I became a prosecutor, I started going to homicide scenes and autopsies and dealing with little children and been abused and horrible, horrible things. I was an eyewitness. I, some of us here, we see that. Other people read it in the newspaper, see it on the news, but it's not real to them. So if we don't have people that didn't learn it in a book, but I saw it. I experienced it that can explain it to others. Then the people aren't going to be motivated. They have to, it's not a head thing, it's a heart thing. They have to feel it in here. They have to understand the pain that's going on. It's caused by people's choices. A couple of examples seven pounds of meth was in a house, a little farmhouse with a mom and dad and seven children. Seven pounds of meth. A gram of meth will get, get you killed let alone seven pounds, but what? All the guns here. But guess what? When my guys hit that house for a search warrant, this is what they found in the baby's crib. And when they asked why there's a gun and a clip in the baby's clip, crib, you know what the mom said? She said, well, it's not loaded. Now you think, oh, that's not good. That, but that's those people. Well, guess what? All those seven kids are going to be in the school system in your neighborhood here at the playground. Whatever attitudes they learn, whatever things they accept as being okay and normal, that they're bringing to your school, they're bringing to your kids and grandkids. It's not okay, but plus it puts them in horrible, horrible danger. These guns are there to protect all of that dope, not from the cops. Chances of the cops finding are very slim, but the chance of someone, another drug user or dealer coming is very likely. 23 year old woman is. Buckets of crystal meth, just huge amounts. She didn't care about people. She didn't care. We had a wiretap on her. I, I listened to her talk to one of her friends that she tried to kill a baby that was her dad, who was a drug smuggler, who taught her how to sell drugs. Her dad's girlfriend had a little baby, but it wasn't his. And she explained how she tried to end its life. And she was mad because it didn't die. Now, if you have a person like that, 23 year old, selling that kind of stuff, do you think they, if they have that attitude towards baby, they care about the people they sell this stuff to? No, they don't. 
over. All of us could tell stories like that. But we took, we've had cases that take us Hong Kong, Thailand, Fiji, Australia, Europe, on a case that was part in part of it was in Idaho. So I had a really fascinating career. I, I love my job. We seized $28 million in one case. It was, it was the best job ever. I couldn't have asked for a better job. But after 29 years of this, I, I woke up one morning and I realized, you know what? I can put another 100 people in jail for the, for, during the rest of my career. And I was too young to retire, so I didn't have a retirement. But I, needed, I, I knew I needed to leave. And I needed to do something else because I felt like all of this stuff was in my brain. But I was just using it to punish people that make that choice. <coughs> and as we all know, how much better is, is it to help people make their choices in the first place so they don't become your suspect or your defendant? That's the key to help people make good choices. And how do we do that? It's, that's, that's a hard thing. I was in New Orleans a few years ago, giving a talk, and my wife got to come with me that time. And after the talk, we went out to the city, and there's lots of beautiful, interesting things there during the day. There's a park, a famous park with a beautiful cathedral. During the day, it's full of life and music and artists and smell of food. It's beautiful. That night, we wanted to go down the French Quarter because that's the famous place from the Bourbon Street where all oh, Mardi Gras and lots of people come. So we went down there and had a nice seafood dinner and walked along it to see what was going on. And pretty much, this is all we saw. If you've been there, Hun Neon Lights Bar, 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 Restaurant Bar, 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 a quarter mile of this. And I like the outdoors, so this did not appeal to me at all. And so Sandy and I are thinking, this isn't fun. We'll get out of here. What's the attraction? But as we go along, like you do in a lot of big cities or anywhere now, you see these four souls there. People carrying around glasses that cost $18 for a hurricane drink that you wasted. Stumbling, yelling down the street. Walk by these people, don't pay any attention to them. If you buy an $18 drink, maybe you could afford to give them a dollar. But a lot of people, they looked the other way. Well, as we went along, we saw more and more of this, and it got more and more kind of sad. This poor soul was laying on the sidewalk. He's got a dollar bill clutched in his hand. His pants are about half off, but I watched tourists step over him without even noticing him. Didn't appear to. They didn't know if he's dead or alive. And, you know, this happens everywhere. People ignore things because you don't know how to help or you don't want to help, you don't have time. But this, this man was there, he's a person. We kept going to see more and more things and we just decided we gotta get out of here. So we moved back to the end where that beautiful park was again. And then we're gonna take off and go to the hotel. But when we got to this park, it wasn't beautiful. It wasn't full of light, it was dark. There was no music, there was no, for hours, they were, they were, it was dark and with people huddled together, passing bottles in paper sacks or needles or pipes. And it was a dark place. And we go, get out of here. So we turned and to head to the hotel and almost stepped on this man. He's laying in the middle of the square. He's got grass, soft grass, 10 feet away. But there he is, almost stepped on him. And it's like both of us are kind of, oh, oh my goodness, what are we looking at? The first thing I thought, was he dead or alive? I actually watched to see if his chest was going up again. I couldn't tell. But in just a few seconds, all of these things came into my brain. What is his name? Where was he born? Who are his parents and siblings? Do they know where he is? How did, how did he get here? What things happened to him that, in his life that caused his life to end or, or be here at 11 o'clock at night, laying on cement in New Orleans, whether he passed out, just decided to lay down or die? What brought him here? All of those things came. 
And I thought to me, and I don't know the answer. I, I don't know. But I do know this. When he was a kid, this was not his intention. This was not his goal. This was not his life dream to be a junkie or alcoholic passed out on the street. So I often think to myself, what if you could go back in time, any one of us, to a point in, the, in his life where something either happened to him or something he did or a combination of those things. And you could intervene in that person's life in a way that changed the course of his life. What, what value would that be to him, let alone the people who loved him? What, you couldn't put a price on that. And yet every single day, we, we all have opportunities to make a small change in some of the course of someone's life. When I talk to kids, I, I talk to them, and you know what? If you want to be a really cool teenager, it's not by being popular. It's to look for that kid in the cafeteria. It sits by himself, himself every day. And he goes to life. And you get to know him. And you don't have to be their best friend, but you know the name. And you tell, you say their name when you see them. And you introduce them to their friends. And you do not know what the impact of that is. We, especially as teenagers, but we adults do it too. We're kind of all inside here. And, and the truly happy people are out, they're out there, they're looking around, they're looking for ways to serve people, love people, get to know people. And so this guy, something went on and he, his life went this way. And how much misery and pain has that caused him and everybody who knows him, the system, the, com the community, everybody. It, 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 he, couldn't, he couldn't quantify the amount of pain, misery, and expense of this kind of life. So the cool thing was we got, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going, I need to go backwards. How does it go backwards? Okay. So after seeing this, we go to the hospital, we go to the hotel, next morning, get on a plane, fly to East Tennessee, where we have six grandkids, the two youngest are twins. And instead of looking at that guy on the sidewalk, I was walking around the lake, the beautiful lake in East Tennessee. And instead of looking at his face, I was looking at this little face. And I was looking at this little face. And I'm walking along this lake, this beautiful day with these little precious children. And I, I can't help but just look up and say, thank you, God. Thank you for these little creatures that we have. Thank you. They have parents who love them. We teach them, we protect them. And I always think that Ed said it's what motivates him is his grandkids. And that motivates me because I know that no matter how much they're protected, no matter how much their parents teach them, good choices, how much modeling or good behavior their parents give them, when they walk out the door, if they go into a world where people are making bad choices, we can't protect them. So we have to pay attention to what's going on in the greater community. We can't put up with nonsense, people making choices that hurt other people. And that's part of our role in coalitions is to help people know things that make a difference in the community. So I go along, I got almost 30 years in and I decide I can't, be, I, I, I can't retire. I got to be wife is thinking, oh, you're leaving that job you love and it pays a lot of money and you're going to do what? I'm going to go do drug education. Oh, that's a good idea. So I basically put my job without a job and I still don't have a job. Ed knows this. When I introduce myself to people in meetings, I, I just say, I'm Monty from my house <laughs> because that's it. And uh, it's, it's just the way it is, but it's okay. Because I learned during that period of time that this was way more important. Whatever prevention, education you can do that helps people make good choices is worth it. Even if the pay's bad, and even if uh, even if your wife wonders um, 
why uh, she's driving a 17 year old car and things like that. Uh, but this, there's nothing better than this. Now, this, oh wait, sorry, this is not the most effective way to teach kids in an assembly. It, it can have an impact, mm -hmm. but it's not the most effective way. If I, if I could pick the most effective way, two, I would do two things in every community. I would do that, but more importantly, I would get a smaller group together like we're gonna to do today, whether they're student leaders, kids with influence, or kids that have no influence but want to make have meaning in their life. They wanna make a difference, they don't know how. I would rather sit down with a, a dozen or two of those kids and talk to them about how they can change the world. Because extra time with those kids will flow out and be way more powerful than an hour talk at the high school in a big gym or auditorium. So that, I, that's what I've heard. So I, I'm very grateful to get to do that today. And they learned during this time that Mark Twain and another said the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And I, I, I'm quite sure every one of us here has had the first one. And hopefully you had the second one to find out why. But an amazing thing is for most of us, there's more than that second day. Because you get to a point in your life and you realize, no, there's something I'm supposed to do now. It's different. And then maybe something different. And your life changes and so that was that's been the case for me in doing this and i've never regretted so we're talking about this discussion i'm using this as an example because it's changed more things than anything else um i came out of the u.s attorney's office to do drug education and what i immediately found out is kids don't listen to us anymore we have no credibility with them at all they, they, we have no credibility. We've told them not to use drugs, and now we tell them we, we can make money from drugs. Mm -hmm. We, Our children live in a world where they simultaneously are taught tobacco smoke kills you, but marijuana smoke heals you. Mm -hmm. how, how, do they, how do we have credibility with them? We don't, they don't listen to us because they see greedy politicians. They see Things that make no sense. So they're woohoo, we'll do whatever we want to do. We don't have to listen to those people anymore. And so we a good way to talk about how we impact the community is to talk about the thing that's changing most dramatically. It's big tobacco on steroids. How many decades did it take the tobacco industry do this before they got caught? This is on steroids. It, it, it is exponentially growing in a way that's scary to people that watched it from the very beginning. But we live in a, in a toxic, we have, our kids live in a toxic popular culture. It's toxic, it's like toxic waste. And it comes in a lot of forms. It could be legal drugs where kids are taught that at an early age that you go to college, the highlight of your entire college career is spring break where you get drunk and pass out and you don't know what happens. That's the height of the college experience. Um, this is the thing. And now we've got opioids, we've got marijuana, we've got vaping, we've got all kinds of things. This is an easy thing because of the topic Ed was talking about. This is the easiest thing to explain how the, what the influence is. This is everywhere. This is in your face constantly. Um, and it's not just the tobacco industry because what's happening with commercialization of pot is alcohol and tobacco are merging those industries, those two other industries that have damaged, killed, destroyed so many lives are merging for, for financial gain. And it doesn't take, it's not hard to see how that's happening. THC and you, beer, soda, candies, all of that stuff. Tobacco companies buying up huge states of marijuana companies. It, we, we could talk about that all day, right? So you've got the big three merging. What, what do you think happens then with their, their power and influence with that wealth to change more laws, to make more money, 
to influence legislators, voters. It's, it's a tsunami that's coming. The products of drug legalization, there's two primary products. One is a crude street drug that has been um, weaponized and a toxic culture. Look at these little boys. Neither one of them are smiling, but whatever adults are sitting around here smiling think that this Bugs for Life is a really cool picture opportunity. I don't know who those people are. I wish I could find them because they need to take, have their children taken away from them. But the commercial, it's not the legalization of marijuana. It's been the commercialization of THC. This is the product. A gram of that stuff is more expensive than the spot price of a gram of gold. So what do you think incentivizes this food? It's more expensive than gold, gram for gram. That's where, that's where we're at. And the popular culture not only does it, they encourage it. People that are, we've made million, they made, we've made them into millionaires. This is their Twitter, Facebook post, their Instagram post. It, and it's not, it's not, um, oh, this is fun for me. It's, th this is cool for everybody. I mean, little Willie, he's like, got his own brand of pot. Is he dead yet? Uh, yeah. He has a lung problem. Probably not related to pot. You don't know it. He with don't with know. as much pot as Willie smoked, he should be 200 before yeah. he goes. But this is what we're learning. Social media. I have hundreds and hundreds of examples of social media where kids approach with everything. Don't drink, drink and drive, park and spark. What's that mean? Parents don't know what that means. We taught them not to drink and drive, but now the cool thing is to get in your car and light up and hot box your car so that when you get to the party, smoke billows out of it because it's so much pot in it. Best part about waking up is baking up. Parents know what that means? Not unless they're pot smokers. Think about what that one thing means. That means the people in that culture, what they're trying to push on people is the best thing about getting up in the morning is getting wasted. And so what, what's the consequences to the rest of society? They get up, they get baked, wasted, high. Then what happens? They go back to bed, they lay on the couch, they play video games, or they go out the front door and get in the car or go to school or go to the job. There's really not much in between. They're either wasting their life or they're out in society when they're fake. It's not okay. It's not okay for anybody. It's Friday, smoke weed, Sesame Street character. So what's the result of all that? Is it's not legalization as much as it is normalization of drug use of all kinds. Because if our kids don't listen to us about pot, they're not going to listen to us about it. Why wouldn't they say, oh, you know what? They lied to us about pot, so what's a big deal about with the mushrooms or LSD? You know, now all these states are legalizing uh, psychedelics, ecstasy. Oregon legalized everything. It's the normalization. These people pushing this want everyone to think this is just normal human behavior. It's okay. It's fun. It's healthy. It's recreation. It's a very sad thing. So Ed talked a little bit about what's happening in Florida. This is off topic and I don't have time to talk about it, but Idaho has no marijuana laws. We, we barely passed it, a hemp bill, but it, it is super, super strict. And that doesn't mean a lot because it could move from there, but our legislature is very They We have two initiatives going on, neither one will pass. The only medical pot bill that came up in the legislature last year was not even granted a hearing. Our legislators wouldn't even hear it. And this next session is going to be the same. Why is that, though? It's because of things that we did. We This year, the pot industry put out articles that said Idaho is the most hostile state towards legalization in the country. Now, if you know anything about Marijuana Policy Project and those national pot lobbying organizations, you know they pour millions of dollars into every campaign. Your 
Sean Morgan guy and others, millions and millions to legalize drugs. And interestingly, he was all worried about medical marijuana. He cried tears about sick people. But what happened as soon as he got back? Forgot the sick people. It's all about recreation now. And it's going to keep going. Because it's all a lie. They, they, these groups go right from medical, and now, like I said, they're doing both at the same time and passing. So what's happening in Florida, there are things that you can do to stop the next stage, but that's a different subject. And you guys know, I'm phone text just like that. If you want to know more about that, I'll help you. I know things that could help, and I'm happy to help. So here's, here's an interesting thing that I'm going to, how far does it talk to your friends and neighbors, family, about pot these days? A lot of people think it's okay, right? A lot of people vote for it, don't think it's a big deal. And you ought to get hostile conversations coming up because people don't know why you're so against it. But I'm going to give you a way, the best way I know to help people understand this issue and not just pot, but any kind of drug issue. And this is how I approach it now. And, and even the potheads can't really argue against it. How do you talk about this very, this subject? Well, you have to understand, you talk using marijuana as an example. You have to understand that, ex, explain this is complicated. You can't talk about this in sound bites. That's why the other side wins. Because all they have to do is say, marijuana cures cancer. And you know what? Most people will go, oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah, that's what we know. They already believe that. So what, when the other side says something, you know, yeah, that's okay. How, how does Ed or you or anybody else respond to that? How do you convince somebody that that's not true? Do, do you get to say, oh, no, it doesn't? Does that convince anybody? No, because the explanation of why it doesn't takes a long time. It's very, very complicated. Their, their evidence is a bunch of anecdotal nonsense. But now the pot industry is so wealthy, they can fund all kinds of research to say it does all of these things. So it's complicated, but let's just do one thing. Let's consider the words that marijuana users use to describe being high. What words do they use? All of these words pop up in your brain. Because we all know them. What words they use to describe what happens to your brain and body when they smoke weed or use weed? Well, those words would include things like stoned, high, wasted, base, right? Those were blazed, gone, faded, stupid, wreck, all of those things, right? And those are just the polite words. They're still not the impolite words. It, now, is that right or wrong? Right. Right. But even the pot people will say, yeah, occasionally somebody say, oh, no, I'm enlightened either. I'm artistic, but that's not the culture. Right. The culture isn't pushing this on kids so they'll, they're enlightened. They're, they're pushing the being stoned and wasted and stupid. That's what they're doing. So understanding this is the culture, then ask your friends, whoever, to think about words that are valued in your community. Things that virtually everyone wants that we can agree on. Those words would include phrases like excellent parents, quality education, safe highways, and point all the way down to safe communities, healthy families, and kids, right? Only weird people don't want those things. So if you establish those two things, and then the next question is, well, how are those two lists compatible with each other? Well, they're not. Do you get more of this? when more people are in this state of mind? Absolutely not. You get less of all of this. But the opposite is true. The more you have of this, the less there is a need for an interest in this part, especially when you start them teaching them young and modeling. So this, this one thing alone, I found wakes people up more than if you can get them to think about that, it may do more for you than anything else. But it's, to me, it's one of the best ways I know to do it. So from that, you ask this, these important questions. Should public policies, laws, and even constitutions be changed to increase 
the number of people in this state of mind? What, what possible reason would we have to do something that undermines all of those good things? Our public officials, our legislators, everybody needs to know that. How is this law, how is this initiative, how is this policy, how is your budget promoting all of those qualities that we want for ourselves and our families and our friends and our community? If, there, if, it's, if it's promoting this, something seriously wrong with you. So think about that in terms of a, a, a non-threatening way to bring the subject up. You can use it for any drug, but marijuana is the easy one to do. But in the other question is, oh, I can't even see it. Should, oh, what's that say? Oh, should we do it? We do that. Do all of those things change our laws dictated by a small percentage of people who want to smoke pot and profit from it? This is a guy that's pushing both of our initiatives in Idaho. He's a recreational pot store owner in Oregon. This is a Fortune magazine. That, that's true. That, that, I, I don't know if we will or not, but that, if I have anything to do with it, that guy's picture is going to be on billboards in Idaho before this initiative comes in. And it's going to say something like, vote for Russ for Idaho's drug czar. Now I've got worse pictures of it than that. So of course, the answer is of course not. That's an ins insane thing. So you, <laughs> given all that, what's our solution? There are lots of solutions. All of them, there's lots of good solutions. You guys are doing a ton of them. The question is, how do we do it better? But more importantly, how do we scale things up? That's the real hard part. How do we get other people to care? I'm going to give you some ideas. Uh, because our three biggest obstacles are ignorance, apathy, and denial. When your Florida pot stuff all started, lots of, oh, no, that will never happen. Can't happen, it's not going to happen in Florida. Or they didn't know what was coming at them, or they just didn't care. Eh, people, they don't hurt anybody. After listening to Ed, could any, if, if anybody listened to all things Ed said, how could they honestly say, oh, this doesn't hurt anything? It's really not a big deal. But how many people are going to hear Ed? And especially if they only hear him a few at a time. If, if you're going from Kiwanis Club to one club at a time and reaching a few people at a time, we're never going to educate enough people to make a change. That's why focus on stakeholders who will then use their knowledge and influence and do things because their circle of influence is large and they need to be motivated. That doesn't mean uh, they're, they're the only important ones, but they have influence. We have to get people to have a sense of urgency. So a sense of urgency requires knowing facts that they don't typically know, but more, under, more important, understanding why that matters, understanding why they should care about this stuff. Because just knowing something doesn't make a difference. So there's, how do we do that? Here's, here's, here's the big question. How do we wake people up? How do we take this group of people, you guys are all doing this all the time, you're awesome at it, how do we wake the general public up? How do we educate, motivate, activate the general public? Because if everybody here votes against the bad thing, but all your neighbors vote for the bad thing, who's going to win? We have to do this on a much bigger scale. So in Idaho, one of the things I'm proud of is we start all of our meetings, we start all of our talks talking about two core principles. And those are this, it's this. It's easier to build, this is Frederick Douglass quote, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men and women. Easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. We spend an inordinate amount of our tax revenues on fixing broken things, on cleaning up messes. If you, if, you, if you looked at the state budget of all the things we spend money for and totaled up all the money we spend on because of people doing stupid things 
and we could turn things around so people, instead of doing those things, made good choices, how much money would we have available to build? To build schools, to pay teachers what they're worth, to build libraries, you know, to, to educate kids, to have better technology in schools, to pay law enforcement officers what it's worth, what they're worth to do. How much money would be available? You don't have to take in more tax revenue. You just shift choices so that we don't spend money on people's dumb choices. And the other thing we all, a, a fundamental principle is it's easier to defend the city than reclaim it. If you have people attacking you and you get taken over, how much cost human life is it going to take to reclaim that city once you lose it? Much easier to defend it, build up uh, fortifications, whatever you need to keep it from going down because it's going to be really hard to come back. Capital Many, 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 many states have lost the quality of life that they will never regain because of choices they made. They'll never get back to it. Um, we don't have to go there. People need to understand that drug use is not a victimless crime. Is this not a common thing for people to say, oh, it's just their body, it's their brain? Well, you think about this on a, on a family level. Is it a victim, victimless crime for a dad who likes coke? To go down in his basement when the kids are in bed and snort a little coke and play video games, watch TV. Is that a victimless crime? Or is it a dad who's checked out, a dad who's unavailable, who may be unaware of things that are going on, who spend money, spends money on something that goes up his nose instead of spending it on clothes and, and food and things for kids to eat? He's, he's putting himself in danger when he buys that stuff. But it's taking harder money for them. It's not a victimless crime. And they go outside the front door, it's certainly not too. And one of the reasons it's not a victimless crime is that drugs impair judgment. It alters reality, sense of time, vision, all of those things. It impairs your judgment. And when your judgment is impaired, you do not tend to make good choices. That's the real issue. It's not drugs are inherently bad, it's when consumed by humans. It impairs judgment and so more bad choices are made. And we all pay for that. We all pay for that. And it comes in various forms. The biggest victim is children themselves. What percentage of impair, what, what percentage of judgment loss is okay for the welfare of a child? Is there any portion of judgment being lost, even for a short time, that's in the best interest of the child? No. No, they're the victims. These choices consume massive amount of resources. You guys probably don't have this, but in the West, we have lots of marijuana grows. And you know what happens at these? They cut down entire forests. They drain all the water. They take all the water. They kill salmon habitat. They kill wildlife. They put pesticides out that are illegal. They kill, they kill endangered species. And they leave entire mountainsides covered like that. It's not OK. Choices affect people's physical health and mental health. It, it, impacts, it impacts your friends, it impacts your families. Choices made by parents, choices made by kids impact. The choices impact, uh, and talked about uh, people that are susceptible to mental illness, that marijuana, other drugs, they can cause, exacerbate, or in, in, increase the speed of mental illness. And that's certainly true with marijuana. It choice, it impacts education. If you can't remember stuff, if you're baked when you come to class, you're basically wasting time or you can't remember it. Choices impact freedom. This 19 year old went to a party with his girlfriend and two friends. They all got stoned up in the mountains. And when they got home, they got ready to leave. You got it behind the seat. Girlfriend next to him, two friends in the back, they got on the freeway, hit a cement wall at 100 miles an hour, killed two of his friends. He went to prison forever. Two of his friends lost, lost their life. It impacts freedom. Is he the only one that made a bad choice that day? No. Three other people knew he was wasted. They got in the car. And because they're wasted, guess what? They were all bulletproof 
didn't need seat belts or didn't remember seat belts, and that's why two of them are dead. Choices impact employment opportunities all time. Choices impact real people. This is a young lady I know, her name's Heidi. She lived in my neighborhood. I've watched her grow up. I knew her since she was called. I knew her mom and dad. I knew her brothers and sisters. My wife and I were good friends with all of them. I worked with her brothers and scouts. My wife worked with Heidi in a church young women's program. We, we loved them a lot. Heidi was particularly gifted. She loved life. She was talented. She was smart. She had dreams for her life. She had been brought up in a good home who taught her good values. She shared those values and for her entire life, up to her senior year, she was a dream child. But for some reason in her senior year at a party, uh, somebody talked her into taking a hit off of a pipe. I don't know why she did that. It's very uncharacteristic of it. But what she found when she did that is she liked it. And her friends liked it, that she did it. And nothing bad happened. No one died, no one robbed the bank. It just felt good. So having bridged that gap, when the opportunity came the next time, it wasn't a hard choice. And so her life gradually changed, and that, that became more of her life. And one night when she was high and feeling bulletproof, someone handed her some white powder and they said, this is way better. Because her brain's up with it. Her judgment isn't there. She goes, oh, okay, I'll try that. She really liked that. It was cold. And later someone said, this is better. And it was Matt. She loved Matt. The next seven years, Heidi was in that thing and out of jail. Got pregnant. Used smoke meth. The whole pregnancy, the little girl was born addicted to meth. Baby was taken away from her. She went hot. She was high when she went to the funeral. Shortly later, she, she had a massive stroke, became paralyzed. The only thing that worked on her body was her eyes. And she was so bad, the doctor said, you need to just take her home because we can't help her. Her body wouldn't even accept any nourishment. Nothing. Her body wouldn't accept any nourishment at all. And the doctor said, you want her to die here, take her home. And they took her home, they put her hospital bed, and they held her hand for three weeks. And her eventual cause of death was starvation. And Sandy and I would go over with other people and sit by her bed and hold her hand and talk to her. Sometimes she would just stare blankly up. Sometimes she would look around like she was scared to death. Other times you'd see a little tear go down her face. We didn't know what was going on, but people would just come and say, Hi, do you live? Love you. We're so sorry. But she couldn't respond and she died. And I was asked to speak at her funeral. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. After the funeral, her parents came up to me and said, Monty, here's two pictures of Heidi. Would you share these with other people? They said, we know you and Sandy love Heidi, and she loved you. And she would love it if you would share her story. And I said, of course, and I have, and I am. This is the same person. This isn't something I got off the internet. This is a little girl that I knew. Went from a wonderful family, see how sparkly, how much life she has in her eyes. Her eyes are dead there. It's robbed her of her soul, of her personality. It robbed her of her life. Like that guy on the sidewalk in New Orleans. If there had been anything, we didn't know. We didn't know there was a reason to be concerned. But had someone interviewed, intervened at that party and some real friend said, no, Heidi, look. Let's go somewhere. Maybe she would be doing what she was destined to do. So these kind of things are what people need to know. Here's some successful strategies you guys are always already using. But I'm going to give you, in case it gives you additional ideas. One of the coolest things that ever happened in Idaho was a big program called Enough is Enough, in which the general manager of the largest TV station in Idaho, Doug Armstrong, gets all of his stuff in the mail all the time. Uh, videos to watch, all of this stuff. He was sitting at his desk one day and he got a video that he felt impressed to watch. And this video was called Masquerade. And it was a video put out by this awesome giant of a man, Milton Korea, 
I don't know if you ever had the pleasure to hear him, but he was one of the most powerful drug educators in America. He just passed away, sadly, but he was awesome. When Doug watched his video on how we put on masks to mask pain, misery, even substance abuse, Doug back to tears. He took that video to our mayor of Boise and had him watch it with him, and they both were in tears. Because I was a neighbor of Brent, and in the drug, the drug business, Brent brought it to me, and we watched it, and realized this message needed to come to Idaho. And so Doug offered to pay Milton to come to speak, and he went to the school board, and his intention was to get one school to come to a place and hear this talk, and everything would be paid for. And when he presented this to the school board, you know what they said? Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We don't have time for that. We, we can't. The teachers don't like it. The kids don't like it. We're not going to do that. But besides, it'll cost us money. We'll have to get school buses and drivers. So Doug left. A couple of weeks later, he came back, walked into the same room from the school board, and put a piece of paper down in front of him. And says, this right here is an agreement by the school bus company to donate all the buses and all the driver's time. What's your excuse now? As a result of that, the school board allowed uh, some cool things to happen. And instead of one school at a high school, before it was over, this is the BSU basketball arena. These are the buses that came from a hundred miles away. And that thing was filled with kids and adults. And as Milton described the pain and misery, because he used to do something that was super powerful. He would say in the audience, how many of you, he asked four questions, how many of you have ever uh, lost a loved one or friend because of drugs or alcohol? How many of you know someone that's been divorced, lost a job, gone to jail? It's, it's, by the time he asked those four questions, 95% of the people in the entire basketball arena are standing. And the adults I'm sitting with over here, they're thinking we're doing a great job, literally gasped and wept as they saw the cumulative pain and misery that substance abuse has brought to these kids. It changed everything. So that developed over a three-year time that Milton, we took Milton all over the state and, and was able to establish drug coalitions in virtually every part of the state. And lots of cool things happened as a result. So a couple of things to think about. I think, and, and Ed already said this, but I think one of the most important things we need to do is we first need to educate our drug coalition. So there's lots that we can't, we can't know. I've been at state conferences, state prevention conferences, 200 people, and asked the, ask them, how many of you know the name of one, even one national pot lobbying organization operating in your state? Out of 200 people in Wisconsin, one person raised their hand. In another state, out of 150 people, two people raised their hand. I said, how do you fight an enemy you, don't, you can't identify? You don't know who they are, what they do, how much money they have, what their tactics are. So we have to educate our own people. We have to educate law enforcement. We know all about dope, but we know very little about these people that are doing these things, how they're funded. We need to train and mobilize youth. I'm going to finish with that. Stakeholders, key stakeholders, got to start there. So here's a couple of things. I'm going to skip some of this. This is the model for coalition. You guys do this. All the sectors. This is awesome. This is like a miraculous thing. But notice, youth are there. What I have seen is that in almost every community I go, just like Ed said, the, the faith community and youth are largely not involved. And I, we could maybe talk about, maybe you guys be great in that area, but most coalitions don't use youth at all. Maybe just like a checkoff thing. And the faith community is out because for a couple of reasons. One is the faith community 
don't think they, they think they don't need to worry about this because they're protected in the church, you know, they need to you know, they don't need. And so they feel like they're isolated, but the rest of the community, for whatever reason, don't want to include those religious folks. And so you lose that ability to change things. But you know what I know? If I go to a town and I, and I want to talk to the most people, I to ask them, what's your biggest church in town? And instead of dragging people to the school on a Thursday night, we go to the biggest church in town where their pastor said, you're going to be there and we want you to be there and we want you to bring your friends and neighbors. And there's 500 people in the audience. And guess what? Amen and hallelujah is used during the drug talks because they get it. If they, if they understand, they, I tell them, you can't be isolated. What's going on in the community impacts your families. You have to go. And from a faith perspective, they, from their perspective, they add faith, prayer, miracles to the combination of things. And we, other coalitions can have that, but that's a powerful, powerful thing. I, I believe that the key to reinvigorating coalitions, I, I've watched coalitions for so long, the same people come month after month, year after year, we get a pro, oh, oh good, we're gonna do our alcohol thing this month and we're gonna do take back this. And we go through and, get, and they sit in a song. And, and, uh, and basically it's a director's report. Whoever's running it. Well, I did this and this and this, everything not. Oh, good job, keep it up, right? That sometimes happens. But when you, I have seen coalitions completely change when they bring in youth, and, and this is what this is what works. You get youth involved, you teach them how to be part of the solution, believe in them, let them lead, and they will come up with ideas that we would never come up with. More importantly, when it's their idea, their peers listen. Because remember, adults don't have credibility. Their peers do. So I like to get people to think about three things, youth inspired, youth developed, youth led. When you get kids in a coalition meeting with adults that are worn out and don't think it makes a difference, but you get kids in there going, whoa, we can do this and this and this, and this is an idea, how about this? To influence their peers. And then when you get them to understand that, then they start thinking about how to influence their community. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that with the kids this afternoon. This is a youth inspired event at a Red Ribbon Rally in our capital every year. Youth put this together. This is some of our awesome youth. These people are warriors. They, they're warriors. So some of the programs that are youth inspired that have happened have been successful. One of my favorites is because I love nature and I'm an avid photographer. There's a, a, a natural high program. Here's a couple of things we've done with that. Kid inspired, kid led. We created all of these posters with these positive messages. These aren't anti-drug things. These are pro-life things. This is how to get high on all the kinds of, and so we made all these posters and put them up in school and they're so popular people started stealing them. Because everybody liked it. And you know what? When one school had it, other schools wanted them. So that, I think this is the 30-minute the version of a youth-inspired video, natural high video. <laughs> shows every imaginable cool fun thing that kids can do in their life. And it's a kid thing. It's inspiring. So here's some final thoughts. Have to think bigger. And knowing these people, I know they think big. The problem is gathering support. That's the problem. It's scaling up. 
One way to do that is find wherever tap the body it is on. I get a call and they want me to come to the top to the city council in the town. I go, I can do that, but why, if you guys are concerned about this, why don't you get Ed, me, somebody else on the Association of Idaho Cities Conference schedule so that we can talk to every cat councilman and mayor in the state at one time. We don't have the luxury of doing a few things at a time. So we have to think big and we have to think about captive audiences. We have to help people understand that education actually works because there was a time in America when this was the norm. Cocaine drops for toothaches, opium for newborns, doctors, nurses promoting cigarettes, all of this, it's went on for decades and decades. Why did that change? Because of education, we started explaining to people what the consequences are of, of this stuff. We started explaining, people started to understand that these tobacco people are evil, awful people and they lie. And it changed things. Can, it, can any of you imagine, I mean, some of the younger ones won't remember, but anybody my age, I, I couldn't have imagined as a child that someday tobacco smokers would have to go outside and huddle in the rain with other pathetic, sad people because they weren't allowed to be in buildings with other humans for that stuff. Can you have imagined that kind of a change? And that's not the only thing. There's lots of other examples. Designated drivers started with a law, a, a law professor's idea that he took to Hollywood and had them, had them write the idea of designated drivers into an episode of Cheers, the Cosby Show, LA Law. That wasn't a government program, it was an idea. And it was scaled up big time because Norm, the guy who likes to drink a lot of Cheers, he got stuck with being a designated driver one episode. So this thing became ingrained in the culture and it, and it saved a lot of lives. We didn't have multicolored garbage cans when I, our, when I was a kid, but now it's a normal part of life. Littering programs. Can any of you get in your car with your kids or grandkids in the back seat and get away with not putting your seatbelt on? No, they'll say, Grandpa, what's wrong? Grandpa, you can't, you're, you don't have your seatbelt on. It's been, been ingrained in their little brains that that's what you do. We taught them that. We know how to do that. And how many people's lives have been saved and helmets from different sports. And now we're talking more about brain concussions in sports and how that's hurting people's brains and all of that. It's an education process. We've even taught humans to take care of these problems. We've taught humans that it's not socially acceptable to go around the park unless you've got a glove and a little bag and you pick up. Think about if there's aliens watching this. They think the dogs are in charge, mm -hmm. that we're their servants. They're going around picking it up. But we taught people that that's the way they need to do it. We have that, we know how to do it. We know how to educate, we know how to change behavior because education works. So it, the good news is that most people don't use drugs and most kids don't either. The good news is if we teach them and show them, gives them the best opportunity. But our kids today, it's not sufficient for just their parents' arms. They need the arms of other loving adults to teach them and protect them and show a good example. The good news is sober parents, Parent better, sober drivers, driver better, sober people live better. And that's just not, not hard to understand. One last personal story. I'm supposed to be done at 12 30 and then questions, right? For a variety of No, I, I, I don't want to take too much time, but because really, it, the only, I love doing this, but the only frustrating thing is I wish I had more time. Ed wishes you had more time. I wish I could listen to. You guys tell all the things you know. But this personal story may be the best way I can explain why I care, why I'm passionate about it. Because when I was 20 years into my career, I'd been to so many homicides and autopsies and seen children that are dead and seen children that were abused, neglected, horribly hurt, mostly mostly because of 
towards the adults only. And a lot of those were because of people with impaired judgment. But I met a lot of bad people. Um, people wanted me dead. People that caused the marshals to make me wear a bulletproof vest during an LA game trial and carry a gun in the courtroom to have FBI agents around my house at night because of my wife and five children to follow me around and change my course of driving. I had a lot of hate, but you know what? Like Ed said, my wife observed a couple of years into my drug education life that the pot people were scarier than my defendants used to be. And I had to admit that in a lot of ways that was true. Last time I was in Florida, my guy found out that I was speaking and he put out a word to all his friends that some weird guy from Boise, Idaho was there to cough against their sacred herb. And by four he was done, there were people all over the country commenting on his Facebook page about how this had to be stopped, how I needed to be stopped. One guy even mentioned bringing mortars and grenades to the place. And all of us went there to talk to him about drug education. It can be kind of strange. But what happened is our five kids, when their kids were all home, four teenagers at one time, which is a wonderful blessing sometimes, and other times a big work from death. We have five kids, awesome kids. But they grew up, went to college, got married, and I found myself, the kids were gone. Sandy and I would go to work, come home, go to work, come home. And one day I woke up and I, I, I had this. I, I thought, life is a fun. But life is scary. Life is full of weird, scary people. It's dark. And, and this scared me because that's not my nature to feel that way. I, I grew up in, uh, I, I feel bad that I had a, we, we had no money, but we lived on a little farm. And I had puppies and wagons and my grandparents lived next to, to us. And I had good friends. And like I hope all of you wish this for every child is when you're little, life is full of wonder and awe because everything's new. Everything's, whoa. Is there anybody in this room that maybe you don't have these before that has a pic of dandelion and moving it to your mother? It's the most beautiful rare rose and it's a weed but that was your baby and that's what how your mom accepted it but that was the world we were everything was awesome and new and gorgeous and i found myself like most adults did through a life where you get way down with burdens bills Health, job, education, all of these things. And a lot of adults get to where they're kind of hunched over and wondering how they're going to get through the day. And that's where I found myself. And I realized that I had to change something dramatically because I did not like feeling that way. And so that opened my eyes. I thought, I got to do something different. What am I going to do? All the things in the world to do. I decided I was going to buy a cheap film camera and start taking I love nature and love hiking and all that. So I got this little cheap film camera, didn't know how to use it, and started taking pictures. And the thing, the thing that happened was when I got this camera, this little camera, and I started looking through the lens, what do you think happened? What do you do with the camera in your hand? And you look at, you, you, you go around being depressed? No, you're looking for things. You're seeking out things that are beautiful or unique something you want to capture and then you want to learn how to capture the image even better because you want to share this thing that you saw oh my goodness did you know this creature existed did you know if you go here there's a waterfall did you know how cute this little neighbor girl's cat is and you just it's like my life went from this to this and i just rediscovered the sense of wonder and awe that is an antidote to the 
things that I worry about at other times. And so I got into photography and I love wildlife photography the most. But pretty much anything fascinates me. Despite, this isn't pleasant to look at, but this creature can make that. People can't make that. And they do it out of a part of their body that seems inappropriate, but they, they do that. But that's what we have. I watched this butterfly land in a park in Portland and drink out of a flower a little girl was sold. It was magical. A little frog on a lily pad in San Diego. A hummingbird I saw in Tucson, Arizona. This hummingbird comes, came to our garden one summer to we grow sunflowers and they like to come here. The neighbor girl's kitten that was so cute in her little sandals. This poor dog was dressed up in the Balboa Park in San Diego. It was a cool thing, but I felt sorry for her. <laughs> a little fox that's up in the foothills near our house. A couple of baby foxes fighting as I'm headed on the way to another part of the state. A little deer and their mom in some beautiful grass. Wild mustangs in the desert in Waihee County in our state shot from a helicopter. My Ed mentioned that my son and I, he has hounds and in the winter we in the snow and follow tracks and treat cats and take pictures of them. They are gigantic. Don't and, do it right now. And this is what they look like if you get in a tree. But it's really the only way to get a good picture of them. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's really fun. But one day on New Year's Eve, I was at the top of a juniper tree looking eyeball to eyeball at this little mountain lion. And on the other side of the tree, its brother or sister was staring at me through the branches. It was like heaven. It was like heaven. So just so you know, they're not, they look cute, but he's got blood specks all over his hand because they've eaten something recently. I don't know where mama was, I never met her, thankfully, but that was a magical thing. A little tiny moose, just barely born. Elf bugling in the Tetons, a grizzly bear. One morning, along the geysers in Yellowstone and watched these two cubs follow their mom through this mist along Yellowstone Lake. And one of my trips to Florida, that's, that's a wild one. It's not to one of your swamps. And I had to learn a lot of things about alligators to do that safely. Um, I thought safely. But the world is full of all these things and it's full of amazing people, which includes all of you. Everywhere you go, there's fascinating people. My best friend, Alan, his first grandchild, my nieces in wildflowers, my grandson, Jackson, in the bathtub, my first granddaughter, Mia, who's learning to walk. The first time she held a starfish, dancing in the sunset for grandma and grandpa. A little girl who inspired me at a 4th of July rally. I didn't know her name, but she inspired me. This is a picture of my grandpa, who I lived next door to my entire life, who was my best friend. He was an awesome man. He lived to be 101. This is grandpa on Father's <laughs> Day when he was 98 years old, driving around the pasture. And this is a picture of grandpa on his funeral program. I talked at his funeral, too. But that funeral was not sad like Heidi's. That funeral was a celebration of 101 years of good choices, of laughter, love, service, example. It was a celebration. What greater tribute could you have at the end of your life that people celebrated the things that you did for people? Not because you want any credit, because that's just the way. World's full of opportunities and adventures. You can do all kinds of things. There's unlimited number of things, including <clears throat> jump out of airplanes when your wife is really nice to you for your 60th birthday. <laughs> Places you can go. Eiffel Tower, standing on the top of the Eiffel Tower. The sun setting, the shadow of the towers going out over Paris. On a cliff in the Yucatan, watching that the sun come up over that Mayan temple. Those are the things that are in the world. We live in this awesome place full of beautiful, wondrous creatures, wonderful people, 
beautiful vistas, opportunity, adventures. All of those things are in the world. That's a picture of the Grand Prismatic Spring at Yellowstone from a helicopter. I'm hanging out. We took the doors off. I'm hanging out over the edge to take this picture. To give you a sense of scale, this, these are people. This is a sidewalk. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I didn't take this picture. <laughs> but that's what you're sitting on. That's what I'm saying. All of those things I just showed you are on that. And if you go further out, that's a picture I took of the last eclipse. The more you see, you go out and out and all these wondrous things till you get so far out, you see things like this. And then the coolest picture I've ever seen was a Hubble telescope picture you've all seen on like it, where they pointed the telescope up to a tiny speck of the universe. Deep as darkest, blackest, most empty part of the known universe started taking pictures. And this was what came back. This is what they found. Now, if it was completely dark, you would see this better. This one picture includes 5,600 points of light in a tiny speck of the universe, 5,600 points of light, and only a couple of these are stars. Every other point of light is a galaxy like that. And every galaxy is estimated to have between 500 million and 2 trillion stars. That's the universe. How could we ever be bored? One of the saddest things I know about humans, some humans, is that they are here in this beautiful world, in this beautiful universe, and it's all available to them everywhere they look. People, games, adventures, all of these things. Endlessly, infinitely fascinating. But that, because of choices they make, that universe begins to collapse, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The focus gets narrow until their life becomes this. This is their life. This is their culture. This is their friend. This is their comforter. This is the thing they need more than anything. It's something they would give up everything for, including their life, the lives and happiness of people that love. That's what it stands for. When I think about drug education, my general thought is the more we can open up children's minds in our own and go from this to this, we're supposed to start to have new systems. We need to help people understand the possibilities, the consequences of good choices, what happens when bad choices are made, and how those choices never just affect the person that made that choice. So, that's basically my what I came to tell you. I hope it was somewhat close to what the listen you guys wanted. And uh, education works. Miracles will happen because of what you do. And if you need to get a hold of me, uh, text, email is the easiest. Just like Ed, and it's 24-7. Basically, so sorry. God bless you for being here. Do what you do. Get some help. Get more people. Fired up. I'll try to help you. We'll try to help you with some kids this afternoon. And then use them. Put them to work. Believe in them. Teach them. Motivate them. Inspire them. Then let them inspire you. That's it. Yeah. I told them everything they needed to know. So. They've all they've all shut up their computers. Well, if you think of anything, we got a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to introduce Tyler Savoy. She's uh, the chair of our marijuana work group. She'll say some words. So another round of applause for Monty and Ryan. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler Savoy, and I do manage tobacco prevention program here at the Green River County for the Quick Dock Foundation, but I'm also an active part of SAFER and I chair the marijuana subgroup along with the tobacco work group. 
Um, I just want to let you know, you know, we have a lot of work to do in this community. I know Ed has given us a lot, he has given us plenty to work on. So our next marijuana work group meeting is Thursday, October 21st at three o'clock. We will be meeting at the Substance Awareness Center or via Zoom. So I encourage you all to attend. But thank you again for coming out. Okay, I just want to say again, thank you. And Ed, next time I will have you come in the winter. Yeah. I promise. <laughs> Right? Yeah, you have been promising that for several years now. <laughs> Last time it was going to be January, yeah. <laughs> but I will next time. But I would just want to thank you again, Monty. We look forward to you staying with our youth. It was great, and you know, to get them motivated is awesome. So I will send everybody out a survey um, just to get your feedback, opinions, um, and anything else you want to hear. So look forward to that. And if you need a certificate of attendance, I can also get you that. But. Again, thank you everyone for thank coming. Thank you everybody on thank Zoom. You. Thank you. It's hot in here now. Yeah. <laughs>